All right, good evening. It is Thursday, February 25th. This is the Arlen Heights School District 25 board meeting. Uh, we already have a motion to put us in open session. So, Madam Secretary, if you'll note the roll, we'll go right to the Pledge of Allegiance. So we begin this evening with some recognition, very well deserved uh, for our nurses. Do we have a statement or anything? Or? Actually, we have uh, Dr. Peg Leswicki is going to come oh, up and share some comments. Good evening. It is with absolute pleasure that I have the honor of recognizing Arlington Heights School District 25's certified school nurses and registered nurses. This year, their guidance and leadership in managing the COVID-19 pandemic has been outstanding. They have worked tirelessly to ensure all students and staff are provided with the best care and most up-to-date guidance from the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Cook County Department of Public Health. This has not been an easy task to say the least. Their collaboration, communication, and willingness to go above and beyond has been phenomenal. I am humbled by their commitment to our students and staff. Words cannot express how grateful I am to partner with each and every one of them. On behalf of the entire Arlington Heights School District 25 community, we thank you for your leadership and commitment. Darlene Carpenter from Windsor. Lori Cataldo Greenbrier. Eve Chapin from South. Tori Eitz from Westgate. <laughs> Jamie Faulkner from Ivy Hill. You're welcome. Mindy Joyce of CSN. Sarah Klansnick, <laughs> Patton, I want to recognize Carol Meyer, but she's not here this evening, <laughs> Stephanie Musoff from South and Thomas. Kimmy Nilek, CSN and team leader. Miranda Rickson, Dryden. Rhiannon Rose, Olive. Deborah Suter, CSN. And last
last but not least, Laura Toussaint from Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you for all you do for our district. Under normal times, uh, it's, it's pretty incredible, but uh, this past year, uh, you have been our frontline essential workers, uh, putting yourselves right, right in it with everybody. So we really appreciate all that you do for the district. Thank you, guys. You guys are welcome to stay, but you're also welcome to go home and get some rest. <laughs> All right, so this is the portion of the meeting um, where we ex listen to community feedback. Um, we do have a very packed agenda this evening, so a little bit uh, uncommon for us, but we do have to put a time limit on. Um, so we're gonna have about a 60 minute opportunity. So we do ask you keep to the uh, three minute um, time frame per comment. Um, and there are written comments that folks due to the COVID um, limitations were able to email us beforehand we've all already read those so we'll try to get through as many of those as possible our plan is to definitely get through everybody that's here in person as a courtesy to y'all um, so just try to keep to the time we'd appreciate it uh, so the opportunity to speak to the board is provided for members of the public who have a comment to make about the business of the board the board appreciates hearing from stakeholders and values your thoughts and questions as the board strives to make the best decisions for the district public and public input can be helpful. In order for the board to reserve sufficient time to conduct its business to operate its meeting in a spirit of civility and decorum, speakers are expected to follow the following guidelines. Please address the board only at the time provided on the agenda and only after being recognized by the board president. Identify yourself and be brief. Your comments must be limited to a maximum of three minutes. The board may shorten this allowed time in order to conserve time to allow the maximum number of people the opportunity to speak. So I just kind of address that. Uh, please be respectful and courteous and the board requests that you not make statements that are personally disrespectful or condescending to members of the board or staff. The board typically does not respond to comments or attempts to answer questions during the public comment period, but we do listen intently and appreciate the input from our community. All right, so uh, number one is Sarah Mungrow. Good evening, I'm Sarah Mungovin at 2522 North Hickory Lane. My requests are short and simple tonight. I am asking you to please have a concrete plan in place for the 21-22 school year. Our district needs five full days in person and a remote academy option for those families that choose to keep their children at home. The current model of instruction is not acceptable and it is way too much to ask of our teachers to facilitate both platforms simultaneously and it is unfair to both groups of children. I also ask that you be transparent to families about when and how this will happen so we can make appropriate plans for next year for our children. And it's time to put education at the forefront and move forward with the best interests of our children. And that is being full remote or full in person and trying not to squeeze in both at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, number two, Katie Roush. Um, Katie Roush, 711 East Suffield. I also just wanted, before I started saying what I had to say, I kind of wanted to say it was nice to be here to see the nurse recognition. It was sweet and well-deserved. Um, but I also wanted to say that, you know, I was here in January um, and I spoke um, regarding the urgency for a plan of action as to what next year looks like. And I was very pleased when Dr. Bine um, had the presentation about the district summer U program and I saw it online and I looked it over. And it looks like registration starts March 1st. And so um, I just want the district to have some clarity um, for the families. Um, right now, the information's on the website, but when will principal share it um, to the families? And what, how are we assessing? Are the teachers deciding who qualifies? I know there's free programs for people who are not on grade level. 
Um, so I just kind of want some clear communication to families because I think it's a great opportunity. And um, I know a lot of families are really eager to um, take part in all the things that you presented when I was here in January. Um, I've also looked at the um, strategic planning goals, um, specifically the one for student performance and how we're going to close that achievement gap. And one of them was refine and expand our continuum of services to better meet the needs of all of our students and reduce the performance gap for low income black, Hispanic and students of disability. I'm glad to see that our district is fo focusing on this because in 2019, the Illinois report card data show that in District 25, there's a 48% gap between where our IEP kids are performing and our non IEP kids are performing. The state gap is 34%. So our district has a larger gap where um, it should be less. So that is where I would like to see our focus. And I know that's in our plan. So my question to you is, how are we gonna address that next year? The plan also talks about learning environment for kids. Uh, this is extremely important as student achievement and learning environment directly connect. The plan says that we must foster a sense of belonging and mutual understanding by cultivating diversity, equity, and inclusion in the pursuit of social justice, global citizenship, economic and environmental partnership. And I'm here to say that I fully support our DEI initiative and that I believe that this will aid the um, reducing amount of the gaps that we have for the groups I just talked about. Um, so thank you for moving us forward and I'm excited to see what next year brings. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Number three is Britt Palantronis. I always mess up that name, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> uh, Britt Palaronis, 336 West Waverly Court. Um, I just wanted to thank the board and thank the teachers and the nurses. It's really great to see us all coming together, but we have learned a lot in the last year. We have re-examined what D25 looks like um, as parents, and I will be the first to admit, it took this for me to really dig deep into what was going on within our district. I will be a District 25 parent for 20 years. I know that's shocking. I have a fifth grader and I have a toddler at home. So knowing where my children are going to be and how they'll progress through this environment is something truly important to me and other students. And I would like the board to look forward into full day kindergarten and a least restrictive environment for all students with special needs. It's time to get creative and to look into options. What does full day kindergarten mean? It means our early learners have the opportunity to be with their incredible teachers and staff and learn how to be in school and not push the academics more than pushing the ability to be around students. I think we have learned that students learn best in these environments this year. And I would like to see the board get creative and push our staff for District 25 to consider a full day option. Secondly, I would like us to look at inclusion at all schools. Um, and what does that look like? I can tell you firsthand what it looked like for my family. We moved to Arlington Heights for this incredible school district. And at kindergarten, my son was determined that he needed extra help. And we were told if he needed that help, he potentially would have to go away from his home school, going into another environment, which left me with two other children that potentially wouldn't be all in the same school. What does that mean? They were able to support my son, but I wonder every day if this was the right choice for him. And if we had the option to have all district elementary schools have special ed support, how can we help more students? And what that means is students like my son could have gotten more support. We could have identified other students within that classroom, within that environment. And then when they get to middle school, they aren't all of a sudden around kids with other kinds of learnings. And I think that that's something we need to look hard into and we need a board and we need the superintendent and staff to look into those options and move our children forward. Sorry, too many notes. And I do believe that having students around other students with learning disabilities is positive. It's good for them. It's good for their friendships. I have watched several friends and families have their children bust across town to other district schools. So please consider this full day kindergarten as a mandatory option in the coming years and also least restrictive environments across all district schools. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. Mary Ann Zaleski, number four. Good evening, um, board. First, I wanna say thank you once again. I know that this uh, has been a very difficult year. I know that you've all had to put in a lot of time, more time than um, 
you probably ever thought you would. So again, thank you for all you do. Um, I'm here tonight because I wanted to talk about two things, twofold. Um, first of all, I am very, um, I'm very much passionate about what the DEI initiative is and how that is going to take place in or be used in our district. Um, I am afraid of anyone that does not believe in diversity, that does not believe in equity and inclusion. And I think that um, as a, you know, a future hopeful parent of D25, that that is something that we can learn more about as a parent and like, how is that going to play out for our children? Um, so I'm hoping that, I don't know, in the next, maybe today, um, but hopefully over the next um, couple meetings, we get to learn more about that because I know that that was something that was started last year um, and then the pandemic happened. So hopefully we can pick that back up and learn more about it. Um, so that's first thing. And the second thing is uh, my own concern as a parent is that um, I have a, a future kindergartner and I need to know what the plan is. Um, she, the, oh, she's not here anymore. Never mind. <laughs> um, so, anyway, uh, she, this the woman that spoke earlier, um, she said it. I just need to know how to plan for my child. Um, I am very concerned about what next year will look like for her. I need to know if what this model is currently is going to be playing out in the future for my daughter. Um, I need to know if we're talking about exclusions where healthy kids are kept out of the classroom. Um, I also, and, and I know that's um, something I'm sure other parents are gonna touch upon, but the bottom line, I would like to say families, children, and teachers, we need consistency. It has been a year of constant change and adjustment and parents as well as teachers are tired. If there are ways to avoid the rug being pulled out from under us like last July, Right? Everybody thought we were going to do one thing and then that changed. Um, if there's a way to avoid that, if there is a way that you can ensure us that we can trust this district, then you will see our community come back together. Until then, many parents like myself are very hesitant to put our trust in the district. We need to know what the plan is and we need to know not next week, not the week after that, not June. Okay, We need to know now. So um, if you have insight on that, please make something happen. Let's not have another meeting and another meeting and another meeting about that. Let, let's make some decisions. So that's it, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you. All right, number five is Leah Ross. Hello everyone, my name is Leah Ross. I live at 532 South Phelps Avenue. And I'm here to talk about something today that definitely does impact this school year primarily, potentially next year. And it absolutely is something that is very likely insurmountable this school year. I just feel passionately from a perspective as a parent and just as a uh, logically thinking person who tends to think into the future that contact tracing and removing healthy children from the school for 14 days at a time just because they happen to be sitting closer than six feet to one another is not sustainable. Um, a little story, the six feet standard has affected our house um, and my two healthy children, sixth grader and eighth grader at South who are being taken care of tremendously by their teachers and their nurses as are my children at Windsor. Um, have been sent home probably a combined total of 32 days since the January four-day start. Um, that to me is a bit unacceptable. They are healthy children and um, they never developed a single symptom. They never got anyone near them, adults or otherwise sick. Um, they never tested positive. Um, grades and motivation did plummet, however. I realize remote learning is the option and that is the very thing that makes this contact tracing possible, but I also don't find that acceptable. Anxiety-inducing worry of being removed again for another 14 days sits upon them and that is of no fault or control of their own. This is avoidable. My humble requests are the following. Please recognize that masks and a reasonable personal space distance are working. What is the point of the mask if exclusion policies disregard their effectiveness in preventing asymptomatic spread? Two, please consider expert advice. That is changing all the time 
for why six feet is not necessary to maintain a healthy school. Six feet was a slow the spread guideline for adults without masks before mask mandates. It shouldn't apply to children and it isn't necessary for schools safe functioning while children wear masks. Please investigate how successfully other districts are using three feet as a safe and healthy distance and utilize documented professional studies that are recent and current and out there that support this as well. At the, at the very least, please consider a much shorter quarantine time for the healthy children you are excluding. Finally, please try to prioritize progress toward normalcy over obsession with control. Never before has removing healthy children from their school building been a condoned practice, even when far more violently spreading stomach viruses, influenza strains, strep have all plagued the schools you were not expected to keep everyone perfectly healthy by removing every child who was near a case of an illness. The Illinois Department of Public Health does not take into account the psychological, emotional, academic, and social consequences of removing healthy adolescents from their school environment for 14 days at a time without notice. We need data specifically on these ex exclusion group students. Do they come down with symptoms? Are they positive? If so, how soon do symptoms start? Do any of them ever become positive cases from probable? Is this information being collected and reported? Or are all of these excluded students just home in their pajamas feeling disconnected and depressed, but physically perfectly healthy? Six feet is only an arbitrary and proven false guideline that will continue to limit in-person days for healthy children in an already compromised school year. I do understand if the change in policy cannot occur this year, I at least ask you to consider its effects on the children as it's happening, and please be certain that it does not occur for the 21-22 school year. As other parents have said, we need to know and we need to be able to count on a full and complete in-person school year for our children without a reliance on remote and exclusions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. Uh, number six is Paul Simkis. Hello, uh, Paul Simkis, 3910 Wilkie Road, Rolling Meadows. I just, I just trying to understand more about the rationale for four day versus five. In the January 21st board meeting, the reasons given were, the first reason was there are classes that needs small group instruction for two to three, four, five kids need some special instruction. And I'd like to know who comprises that. It, they weren't labeled special ed kids. So do we have three layers? Do we have normal mainstream? Do we have small group instruction needed kids? And do we have special education kids? So that was something that kind of confused me. If, if that is the case, that the, we've always had those ones, they're not really special ed kids, but they're, they just need a little extra. How was that handled when we were, uh, you know, back in normal times, when we had five days a week? Uh, did the teacher take those two or three off to the corner while the others worked independently? You know, is there, I'm just saying, is a reason to not have five days is there some way we can work around that if there is that layer? But I'd also like to know more about who that special small group instruction, what, what does that entail? The second reason given was a collaboration and planning. Obviously, when you're teaching in two different modes, three modes, I, I do not ignore the fact that it is much more work for teachers. And let me state the obvious, as soon as we get back to five days and there's no more uh, remote, it's gonna be a lot easier. Uh, but it is, as they are in class four days, is there a way to get more of that done? Okay, in other words, I guess my, the reasons we were given for Monday, I'd like to just, explore those more and see if there's a better way. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, number seven is Carrie Hood. Hi, Carrie Hood, 1025 East Cherry Lane. 
Now that our teachers are fully vaccinated, I hope we continue to take more steps towards a return to full in-person learning five days a week, as multiple people have already stated. Mondays have become more asynchronous for my kids, and they, it's the opposite of what my especially second grader needs. Um, also, I asked at the last board meeting, I haven't seen anything posted yet, but I want to know what the plan for next school year is now. I know too many families, and there's some in this room, I won't point them out, but they have their kids already registered at private schools for next year. Private schools that have been in person in full five days a week since August. There is no trust in this district because of all the carrots we had dangled in front of us in July, only to have our, inch, our choices taken away. We can't repeat this next year. My kids can't go through this next year. Teachers can't go through this next year. We need a plan and we need it now. And I hope the board holds the district accountable to get that plan out there within the next few weeks. Also, next year I wanna ensure that in-person teachers are only teaching in-person students. They can't keep doing this mix of in-person and remote at the same time. I think a remote academy that the district can find and you know, give as an option to families who need remote learning would be perfect. And then our D25 teachers can do what they do best, which is in-person instruction. I also would like that next year kids don't need to rely on using devices in the classroom as heavily as they are now. Um, again, my elementary grade kids, they need practice writing with pens and pencils still, and they need to stop learning through a screen. Um, as uh, one other person just stated, with everyone in the building wearing masks at all time and the fact that our teachers and staff are, not, are now fully vaccinated, contact tracing, contact tracing for probable cases should be eliminated. We ha still have many levels of mitigations that we're taking, so it shouldn't be required to remove people that maybe met only two out of the three levels of mitigation. So for example, if everyone's wearing a mask, which we are, everyone's washing hands, everyone's doing temperature checks, if someone happens to come in within six feet of or less of a probable case, they still have other mitigations that are protecting them. They should not be removed from school for 14 days. Um, and next year, I hope we take a bigger look at if we need contact tracing at all. One last question is for clarification of the Summer U program. In the last meeting, Dr. Bynum, you said that it would be free and available to all students with the reading and math. Enrichments are extra costs, which is understandable. But I've seen some conflicting information where now kids have to be qualified to receive the summer U program. So I hope that's not true, but thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, number eight, Dr. Marianne Court. Hi. There's a psychological term called minimization. It's defined as a type of deception aiming to dismiss the feelings of others as unimportant. Minimization has been prevalent in defending the actions of our district over this past year. Our children have been told what they need to do for the greater good of society during this pandemic, even though it challenges their deepest needs and desires. They are told that their favorite things aren't important enough right now and to bury their disappointment, sadness, and anger. I have been a psychologist for 13 years and see mainly children who struggle with depression, anxiety, and trauma. I have learned a lot about suffering and healing and what is needed to move forward. First, children cannot heal in the environment that made them sick. We are seeing everywhere that children's mental health is declining rapidly. While four days a week in person is an improvement, there are several other factors that are keeping our children sick. Preventive quarantine of healthy children as a means to protect adults is not solving the problem. Children are not responsible for making us feel safe. Their mental health needs to be made a priority, if not the priority. We are asking children to set aside their needs for emotional connection, physical activity, and a full education, even though they aren't the ones spreading this virus. Dismissing these needs then damages their core belief that their own well-being is important enough to fight for. The second point I want to make is that I believe we are overestimating the resilience of our children. How many times do we hear, they'll be fine, don't worry, you'll see the signs. Has anyone in this room tried to get their child an appointment for therapy lately? Their waiting list can be over a month long. 
The schools have been doing their best with what they have, but that's typically only one psychologist and one social worker per school. We need several more that are able to meet with children at all times throughout the day. We also need an emailed weekly mental health check-in, an optional three-question survey about your child's current mental state. That way the leadership can get a better understanding of what their decisions have caused our children to experience. I believe we are currently at a standstill and chaos remains. No one knows when the next district email will come that their healthy child is now home for two weeks. So I ask you, stop minimizing the chasm of distrust between the community and our leadership. Share your plan for the next school year now, one in which we have the choice to send our kids to school five full days. Stop minimizing the struggles of those parents who are working and cannot stay home or sit by the computer to help their children e-learn. Stop minimizing the pressure you are putting on the teachers for doing two jobs at once. And stop pretending our kids are okay. Thank you. Uh, number nine, Antonio. I screwed this name up pretty good once. Should I try it again? That's all right. <laughs> all right. Antonio Sasmita Mangala, 1007 East Mayfair Road. That is a tough one. It's not that hard. So good evening. Tonight I want to talk about moving forward for next year. Um, I think we've seen that the biggest lesson from this past year is that we need to have a plan. Just trying to make it up as we go doesn't work. Um, we knew COVID was around last year and all summer, and it, it just felt like we we tried to wing it. and it. it our community is like divided now and it it's all because there's no good leadership from the top and no plan so moving forward we know COVID is going to be around next year um, it's either going to be the same as it is it might be better because as the vaccine rolls out or it might get a little bit worse but we have to account for all three of those scenarios and uh, in our planning um, I think we know that all the, the staff and the teachers, it's great that you guys were all able to get vaccinated. Um, so that needs to be taken into account that moving forward, that's a part of it. Um, I'm an essential worker. I've been working this entire time. I, I, I haven't been able to secure a vaccine yet. Um, it, it doesn't mean I'm upset that you guys have. I think it's absolutely fantastic that you have, um, as it should be. Uh, but it, you know, not everyone has yet. Uh, so we need, to, we need to be able to collaborate there needs to be some transparency of what the process is, um, not just surveys saying um, what, what do we want. We need actually action um, and not just behind closed doors. This is what we're doing. Um, if you're going to have people involved, that's fine, but we need to know how they're going to be picked, who, who they are, who's helping. Um, we, I think we went through this whole thing with the uh, transition advisory committee that it, it just felt like there's too much smoke and mirrors and no accountability or no transparency of what was going on and what, who was making the decisions. Uh, so for next year, we need to know what is going on and what the plan is. Um, they, we have to have kids in school five days a week. And if, for those who wanna stay home, then we need to have a remote option for them. It's not fair for the teachers to be working two jobs, essentially teaching online and in person right now. Um, and also on top of this, I, I am a proud union member. Um, I support unions. And so I um, very much believe that it's not fair to them that they are, are doing this right now, the way that they're working. Um, I also believe that there needs to be collaboration. So I, I sincerely hope that the teachers union will come to the table and help with moving forward um, to make a plan for next year so that all the students who need to be or who are able to be in school, want to be in school, can be. All the teachers who are teaching in person don't need to be teaching kids at home, and that there's an option for those who can actually, or that want to be at home, there's an option that they're not being forced to be taught by someone who is in a classroom with other students who are in the classroom as well. Thank you very much. All right, number 10, Jacqueline Jurangowski. Hi, Dr. Vine and the school board, parents. <laughs> um, how did I end up coming here tonight? Um, what it began for me was with the culturally responsive teaching and leading standards that people may have heard about. 
Um, I knew nothing about them and spent uh, time doing some reading, phone calls, talking to people at ISPE and JCAR, trying to educate myself on what it was all about. And any parents who are interested, um, Representative Steve Reich did two really great posts to explain the role of JCAR and what those standards were about. And if you go to steve463.com, it's a great way to educate yourself. When I found when I was learning about the standards, something reminded me of a policy that I'd heard about at a school board meeting, and it was um, policy 132. And I'd asked if a slide could be made for the parents here to be able to see the policy. I don't know if you guys have it for them to refer to. Well, I think everyone here can agree that we've all chosen to send our children to at schools in District 25 because of the great schools. And I have questions to be better informed about the policy and have put them forward to the board in an email. And I wanted to share with parents what I've learned so far as we're all trying to ponder about the 2021-22 school board. And I encourage, excuse me, school year, and I encourage all parents to ask questions of the board, those running for the school board, and Dr. Bine. Um, what I have learned from a FOIA request is um, looking at policy 132, I understood from an email I had from Dr. Bine and the July 16, 2020 minutes, the League of Women Voters recommended the language for the policy to the board. The lawyer for District 25 reviewed and approved that language and the board voted six to zero to approve this policy on August 20, in August in 2020 after a word change when the policy was first introduced in the July meeting. When I looked at the minutes from the July 16th meeting, Dr. Bine had stated, it is important for the Board of Education to lead District 20 Top 5 into a future more purposely focused on eliminating any racial injustice that exists through our curriculum, our actions, or inactions. We're doing important work already to advance racial equity and justice. We can, with intentionality, do more. Um, Dr. Bine has signed an agreement with ICDHR, which is the Illinois Commission on Diversity and Human Relations, which is actually out of Arlington Heights, and is committed to $23,500 of the taxpayer dollars for webinars, facilitates DEI dialogues, workshops for inclusive curriculum, and actually the first webinar took place on January 20th and was led by Reverend Clyde Brooks, who owns ICDHR, and I know he's spoken um, several times in the area, and Destiny Piers, who's a social psychologist and lawyer on the topic cognitive and implicit biases in decision-making for educators. Well, I know from looking at the standards, um, Illinois has, a, has been quoted to have a deficit of about 2,000 teachers, and actually from talking to JCAR, they think that number is actually up at 4,500, but I've uh, submitted a request to ISPE to find out if that's correct. And also looking at the nation's report card that's been mentioned tonight, it showed that Illinois schools in general in 2019 scored below the national average in math and science. And I know we don't have any data for standardized testing from you know, the last school year and this year, but I think all of us can say that anecdotally, we feel fairly safe in saying that scores have probably dropped. Now, based on the information that I, above that I've talked about, I have questions. Thomas Sowell asks about having evidence to support how processes are going to achieve desired outcomes. He says to focus on the facts. I'm not sure how this policy is going to benefit the students, retaining and attracting teachers, su um, support personnel, parent organizations, and the community of District 25. I think we would all benefit from a separate school board meeting to understand the policy and to be able to ask questions. Perhaps Reverend Brooks and Dr. Piers would be able to come and explain the benefits of this policy and how it will impact and enhance curriculum. By asking questions, having conversations, and focusing on processes, outcomes, and how these outcomes will be measured, providing transparency for parents to understand policy 132 and what it's going to mean for our children in District 25. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, number 11 is Aaron Calloway. Hello, Aaron Calloway, 311 North Belmont Avenue. Um, I wanted to come here tonight. Um, I have a smile on my face. You can't tell, but I'm so happy to have my kids back in school. I wanted to just say thank you. Um, they are happy to be with their friends. 
They love their teachers. They love being in their school building. And I know it took a lot of work to get there. And I just wanted to say thank you because not all kids in Illinois are back in school yet. So, um, you know, they, they love real gym class. They love recess. It's the little things that they just haven't had the experience the first half of the year that have really made them happy. Um, all parents know you can only be as happy as your saddest child. So I wanted to say thank you for that. I also wanted to commend District 25 on your vaccine distribution. I know that took a lot of work from administration and nursing staff to get everyone vaccinated. I think that's a huge accomplishment. Um, a few points of discussion going forward that I think you probably already have been talking about, will be talking about. Um, it echoes a lot of what people said earlier tonight. When will remote Mondays go away? I think they've kind of served their purpose. I think it's time for the kids to be back five days in the classroom. Um, the teachers, I think, have a good groove going now this year. We need to address when those are going away this year and will they stay away next year. Uh, second of all, I wanted to ask when, when will lunch be coming back in school? Is that something that's on the table for this year? Will there be hot lunch served next year in school? Um, I also wanted to talk about the potential for a tax abatement in District 25. There are two other school districts in the suburbs that I know of where the board has passed a tax abatement for the year. I know our teachers uh, received a well-deserved $1,000 bonus this year um, just for the difficulties with COVID. I know there's some excess funds uh, that other districts have given back to the taxpayers. And then again, to echo, uh, we need a plan for next year. I don't think anybody wants to repeat, you know, the kind of beginning of the start of the year we had this year. Um, I think the whole community wants to know concrete plan that we're going to commit to and stick with going into 21-22. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Number 12 is Jennifer Hutzinger. Hello, Jennifer Hunsaker, 316 North Douglas. Um, I, like Aaron, just want to give my sincere thanks that our children are back in school. I had pulled my kids out for a while and homeschooled them, and now that they went back four days, they're back in, and they couldn't be happier. I was worried about my son um, adjusting to it. I mean, he was happy from day one. And like she said, it's the little things. It's just seeing the people in front of them. Going to recess. I, I know my son was worried about being in a zone at recess. He could care less. He's with other kids. So all of these mitigations are working, and they're working fabulously. So thank you to that. Um, now that our teachers are vaccinated and that cases are lower than when this whole thing first started, we once again, I need, we need a well-defined plan for moving forward. Um, I know you all feel it. Everything was a fight this year. Um, our community has been divided and it has done nothing but hold our kids back from the academic and social gro growth that they deserve. Um, we really need a plan that fully details what school will look like. We must get back to five days in person. We must not require that our teachers teach to both in-person and remote students. I'm a sub in this district and I think parents think they know how hard it would be, but you truly don't know how hard it is until you are in front of that computer and you've got maybe four, five kids on a screen counting on you, looking to you, and then you've got the multitude of kids in the classroom and you feel torn. You wanna make sure you connect with those kids on that tiny screen and you wanna connect with the kids in the classroom. Um, it's just too much. Um, I'm sh and I'm only there for small snippets of time. I have no idea what an actual teacher goes through. If the state or federal government are going to legally require school districts to provide remote next year, or if you as a district are going to decide to offer that, the current mode of teaching needs to change. Teachers cannot effectively teach to in-person and remote students at one time. It's asking too much and it's shortchanging everybody. It also is requiring students to do a large portion of their work on a device, which is not optimal. That's why I pulled my kids out this year. Every single pediatrician and doctor out there will tell you 
limit screen time, limit screen time, affects, it's damaging. Um, so I really hope that moving forward, we can rely less on those screens to be teaching them. I also want to make note of Schaumburg District 54's decision that students and staff will no longer need to quarantine for two weeks after traveling. To me, that's a district who's looking to keep kids and staff in. And I worry that our, our district continues to look for ways to keep kids out. With cases at record lows, all teachers vaccinated, those who chose it, and science proving that schools are safe, our board must continue to adapt and truly look at who we're excluding and why. I found this quote by Peter Hilton super apropos. Adaptability to change is itself a hallmark of a successful education. So continue to adapt because it's working. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's all the folks that turned in that are here, I believe, as I committed. I wanted to make sure we, we honored everybody here. And thank you all for your comments. Um, how much time do we have? Do we have any time for? Are we out of our hour? And as I said to all those folks that, e that did email them ahead of time, the board has already read them. It would be nice to be able to read them aloud here. Seven but minutes. <laughs> but we got seven minutes to read the, okay. a, a few of them anyhow with the same three, three minute limitation if we can put that on the written word. Okay, just for clarification, we do, we do have a change in what we've done mm -hmm. in the past with some updated legal guidance. Um, in the past, I would categorize anything that was submitted electronically. Um, our updated legal guidance says we actually have to read verbatim what was submitted electronically within the time limit provided um, by the board. We will still post all comments um, that were submitted up until the start of the meeting tonight. Those will be um, posted tomorrow or Monday as soon as we can. Um, and the board has access to have read these ahead of time. So submitted by, sorry, small print, uh, Gabby Fidanza, wondering if um, we can look towards letting the kids use their lockers in regards to books and their backpacks again. My daughter's backpack is between 15 to 20 pounds, which seems pretty heavy and not good for the back in general. I know we wanna maintain social distancing of six feet whenever possible, but the CDC does state COVID-19 spreads mainly among people who are in close contact within about six feet for a prolonged period. A key point being prolonged period of time and the kids in theory should not really be taking that long to drop off their backpacks and or exchange books if they wish. Thank you for your time. From Jeremy Glass, wondering if the district is reconsidering the full in-person model given that the new CDC guidelines released on February 12th, 2001 still suggests a six foot distance between students and the fact that the entire eighth grade of South Middle School needed to be moved to remote learning. Hybrid seemed to be a better model with fewer disruptions, quarantines and close contacts. Um, the next um, one name withheld, I do not wish for my name to be read out loud. Although many teachers are being vaccinated, I do feel that because there are more students entering as in person, it is becoming more unsafe for our children. The classrooms and common areas and amount of students using restrooms is a concern. Also, I would love to see schools reopen like they did pre-pandemic. I feel that right now there's an increase in cases of our area and that is a high concern. As more public places open, more people are apt to dine indoors, take their children to indoor play areas, go on vacation, and are taking more risks to exposure. I feel like we should go back to the hybrid model to accommodate the students who are going to school. Many students have loose fitting masks. They fall down or off their noses or mouths and it's just a concern overall. The next one is from Michelle C. Please stop spraying chemicals around our children and teachers during school hours. It is enough to spray at night just like all private schools do. There is no research showing how much those chemicals are safe and how much is already cancerous. If you have to disinfect during school hours, please use a plant-based solution. And from B. Mazur, stop using chemical sprays. Virex sprays when used in big amounts are not safe to our kids. From Megan Worthington, 
I would ask the board and the superintendent to share their plans for the rest of the school year and intentions for next school year. Are there plans to go five full days per week? My hope is that you are planning for five full days in person by August, though I wish that would be happening sooner. Private schools and preschools have already had registration for the next school year. Households with two working parents need to plan for next year as registrations for CAP, private schools, and private preschools have already happened or are happening soon. As a working parent, I'm asking for your transparency and your plans about when you'll move to five days per week and for the 21-22 school year. Thank you for your consideration. From Kelly Janua, we need peace of mind that District 25 schools will be returning to full in-person soon. There is no reason to have one remote day per week. Please make this change soon as we are all very anxious. And from Amanda Bansali, now that the CDC has updated their guidelines for schools and COVID-19, what plans, if any, does District 25 have for the remainder of the year? Does the district feel the need to update their mitigation strategies and classroom distancing based on this new and changing information? And she shares a couple of links. Um, and continues, given that COVID-19 is an ongoing pandemic and vaccines are not currently FDA approved for our children, not available to many in our community, what is District 25 planning for the next school year? This is a problem that won't be solved by the end of the summer, and it behooves all stakeholders to prepare as much as they can in advance for another school year with COVID still impacting our lives. In my opinion, the district should explore using the increased governmental funds to lower class sizes so that in the event of community outbreak or the spread of a new variant in our community, schools can stay open in the future. I understand that many of our schools are at or close to capacity. I encourage the district to explore finding new venues to teach classes and recruit new teachers to teach smaller class sizes, especially at the elementary school level. And I think I have time for one more uh, from Germano Franzoni. I suggest the district consider going to five days in person for the families who opted for in person. Teachers have been vaccinated. Number of cases in Illinois are dropping significantly. The safety measures in place at school are proving to be effective. Plus, what is the difference between four days and five days? Thanks for all the efforts you've put and are still putting into this situation. I think it's time to move one step closer to normalty uh, five days school. Okay, thank you. And again, uh, for any that we didn't get to, our apologies, um, but they have been read and will be taken into consideration just like the ones that were before us this evening. Um, with that, I will move to our next agenda item, which is the consent agenda. And I would need a motion. Mr. President. Yes, Aaron. I move that the Board of Education approve those items on the consent agenda as follows. Personnel report and addendum to personnel report, treasurer's report, invoices, regular and closed session meeting minutes of January 21, 2021, special closed session meeting minutes of February 11, 2021, hold closed session minutes of July 1, 2020 through October 15, 2020, and October 29, 2020 through January 31, 2020, per board policy 2220E1. Released Closed session minutes of October 26, 2020 and 20, October 27, 2020 per board policy 2220E1. Destroy audio tapes of January 1, 2019 through June 30th, 2019 per board policy 2220E1. All right, thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Gina. Uh, there were no items to call out specifically, no questions, so I think we can go ahead and take this to a vote. Why don't we start down there? Who's down there? Rich? Yes. 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 All right. Consent agenda passes 7 0. On to communications to and from board members, beginning with an update from Mayor Johannesson on NNS NSSEO. Just a few highlights. Um, the, uh, the NSSEO community is returning to full in-person school as of Monday, this coming Monday, March 1st. And they have 
um, the second round of vaccinations for their staff next week as well. Um, something, a couple things that I don't generally talk about that are super important that are going on there is how involved Dr. Hackett and her staff are in what's going on state, at the state and federal level for special ed. Um, it's a constant battle in normal times. Um, COVID has, of course, made things more challenging. And now with a new administration coming in, it's not like starting over, but there's a lot of new um, partnerships to forge and things like that. So they work very hard and deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, also, I wanted to point out that they have an incredible amount of professional development available on the regular and also for parents. Um, recently, they've been doing some classes in mental health and mindfulness for families, and they've um, made a course available for teachers, which District 25 has participated in. Thank you. All right, next is IASB. I'm gonna defer to Anisha on that one. Do you have an update this month or no? Yeah, I, okay. I do. Uh, I'm, I've been, uh, there's a book club that ISB is presenting a discussion on a book called The Trust Edge. And tomorrow at 12 o'clock, you guys can join me and the rest of ISB members across Illinois. Uh, it's a book by David Horsaga. And there's three points that I wanted to bring up that are really good uh, that in this whole book, but the book, the author is actually gonna be part of this virtual meeting tomorrow at noon by ISB. And uh, some of the, the points are the first one is that trust is a confident belief in a person, team, or organization. And while it may appear to be static, trust is more like a forest, a long time growing but easily burned down with a touch of carelessness. And the third point I thought was interesting was that clarity unifies, motivates, and increases morale and inspires trust, and that clear communication leads to trusted colleagues and happy employees. So at this time where many of our community members have talked about uh, a difficult time for our community with lots of division, uh, I thought this would be, um, this is a really good book and I recommend it to my colleagues uh, to participate tomorrow at 12. Thank you. Any other IASB updates? You're probably closer to it than anybody being relatively new. No, all right. Uh, let's move on to Ed Red. Anything from Stacy on Ed Red? Uh, the most recent EdRed meeting, I think you're all already aware that the executive director will be leaving in April for new opportunities. Uh, they discussed the EdRed priorities, um, and then they had an AASA representative talking about the uh, CARES Act II funds uh, that we are all uh, anticipating in the near future. Um, making it clear that uh, the federal guidelines, there are no limitations on the spending of those funds. Uh, we have seen letters from IAS, uh, ISBE that does encourage some usage of the funds, um, but from a federal perspective, there's no legislation that dictates it has to go towards any one specific thing. Anything to add, Nisha? Okay. Yeah, no, okay. All right, I was, let's move I was on. I just want to say ditto on Sarah oh. Hartwick leaving. She was an excellent executive director. Um, and the fact that she's leaving, we're hoping for a new executive director, but she has done some excellent work in setting groundwork on EdRed's equity ad hoc committee. And looking, it would be great to see somebody come in and continue her great work. All right, thank you, ladies. Uh, let's move on to communication to board members. Do we have one from the PTA? I have a statement that okay. um, Liz Nierman, the PTA Council President, provided. Um, the Arlington Heights Council of PTAs is awarding 10 $100 scholarships for Summer U or Park District scholarships to current students, kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, they're doing a Summer U by U contest which challenges students to design their own summer course and it's live now. You can find more information and the link to apply on their Facebook page or their website, which is ahcpta.org. The application deadline is March 15th. All right, thank you, Liz. Uh, ABC 25, it's Anne here, hard to tell with the mask. Hi, 
everybody. I'm not sure if you're aware. Um, I take for granted that everyone doesn't know what the foundation does and what we stand for. Um, ABC 25 stands for a better community for District 25. Um, and I'm here today to ask for you to support our foundation because we are supporting our teachers and our schools. And it's just so important, the work that we're doing. So if anyone has questions about what we do, please come to me anytime. I have an open door to talk about it. Um, we've been busy this year. On top of the monitors for every homeroom teacher that will be used for years to come, we gave over $20,000 in teacher grants to fund creative, innovative, and excellent education for our district children. We also sponsor grants for schools with 25% of their households joining the foundation. Three schools have already met this goal and will receive $2,500 that the buildings can use at their discretion for different ways to um, help our children. Congratulations to South Windsor and Greenbrier for earning that. Our other schools are very close. It's not too late to join. We'd love for you to join and support our amazing teachers and our schools. Another way we raise funds is through the Get Burb Challenge. This is such a wonderful way for our community to get together. The race is in the planning stages for both a virtual and in-person option on April 24th. Registration will open in early March and we hope that you'll join us in one of the formats. Keep an eye out for some awesome videos from our gym teachers to encourage you. Um, another thing is to please follow us on Twitter. If you wanna see what those grants are, our teachers do an awesome job of tweeting out all the different grants they're receiving and it's just really cool to see them using those in the classrooms they're already being used with our children this school year um, and then you can also follow the race to get updates on when all of that's coming out and what that will look like i'm sure it'll look a little bit different but it'll be really nice to be able to see everyone out there joining together to support our teachers and our staff thank you Ann. all right uh eta kelly Trevlin. We're getting the whole ATA. Yep. Well, well, the whole ATA is about well yes. good point. Yes, yes. yes. All yes. right. Good evening. Um, I don't know if you've all met our exec board, but I'm just going to introduce everybody. Over here we have our wonderful treasurer, Dr. Curran um, Duffy. She's uh, fifth grade at Westgate, fourth grade at Westgate. Over here is Nancy Abrascato. She is kindergarten, and this is her last year in District 25. Yay. Um, we have Bree Pustai. She's second grade at Windsor. And this is John Dolniak. He's, um, first of all, she's my rights and responsibility. She is our secretary, and then John is our vice president, and he's PE at Patton. So these are our exec boards. We work very close together, and um, I'm very grateful for all that they do for me and for us together and as our, for our membership. Um, as I said, we do represent our ATA membership and we are very honored to do so. Together, the five of us, we have a combined 106 years of teaching in District 25. So I think that's pretty cool. All right, um, first of all, we'd like to thank Dr. Bine, her team, the nursing staff, and everyone else that contributed their efforts, their time and efforts for the opportunity to get vaccinated. We are all so very much appreciative. Next week, we will pause to reflect on the one year anniversary of a moment that turned all of our lives upside down due to no fault of our own. In those 365 days, there have been highs and lows. And this year of uncertainty and doubt, there are also many things to celebrate and to be thankful for. Teachers work hard to make sure remote students are feeling included and integrated into the classroom. This means making weekly care packages for remote learners so they have the supplies they need for science experiments, classroom activities and projects. Teachers pair in class, in class and remote students together on Zoom so that students have a chance to work collaboratively. Teachers work to make sure students' faces are visible on their whiteboards and use cameras in the classroom so remote and in-class students can share face-to-face -face time. Teachers are working to make sure all kids, both remote and in class, have the same academic opportunities and are making good progress. They ensure this by working with small groups. At the elementary level, teachers are listening to kids read individually both on Zoom and in class. Teachers are using benchmark assessments to monitor progress. They are using small groups to give a boost in any area a student may be struggling in, both on Zoom and in person. At the middle school level, teachers are trying to connect with students in class and online by conferencing one-on-one -on -one and building relationships that we know are so critical at this age. We are trying to find the best ways to ensure all students feel included. 
In addition, teachers are making sure all students have the materials they need to complete lessons. This may mean creating templates that can be used digitally. It may, re it may mean rethinking the way a group project will work so that all students are included or uploading materials and scheduling assignments so the remote students can ac access the same materials that in-class students use. It takes a tremendous amount of additional time and planning to create curriculum opportunities that engage students in school and at home. Teachers not only in our district, but everywhere, have had to learn new technology, new programs, a new way to teach in the blink of an eye. I am proud, we are proud, to report that our teachers, although not an easy task by any means, are doing a stellar job making it work. Teachers are making every effort to make each child feel included, whether in person or on Zoom, making the school year as normal as possible in a very abnormal year. On March 13th, 2020, everything about teaching changed. In the days, weeks, and months since, teachers have had to relearn every aspect of the school day in order to make teaching work, sometimes at a lightning fast pace. Teachers have had to remain steadfast and consistent, and yet flexible enough to pivot at a moment's notice. Teachers have learned how to teach on a dual platform and making it work. Teachers have done what they could, could do show their students the meaning of resilience and to teach them so their experience in whatever capacity, remote, hybrid, or four days full in, as if nothing has changed. Now that is something to celebrate. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right, let's move on to student learning. Uh, we have an assessment update for the fall of from the fall of 2020. Dr. Becky Fitzpatrick and team. Good evening. So thank you for the opportunity to share some information about our fall 2020 assessments. Each year, District 25 gathers information about our students' achievement using standardized assessments to assist teachers in differentiating instruction, to aid in the evaluation of teachers, to make our placement decisions, and to serve as a temperature check on how our students meet the state standards. During the last 11 months, our primary assessment focus has been on differentiation and providing responsive instruction to meet all of our students' needs. The pandemic has impacted many facets of our typical life, our assessment data included. So our data will look different than in years prior. Those of you that have seen our assessment updates in the past will notice a few differences in our presentation this year. Last spring, the state assessment, which is the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, or IAR, was canceled mid-administration. So we do not have our typical view of District 25 performance relative to District 214 feeder districts. We scaled back on our assessments this fall to balance our desire to do a temperature check of our students upon their return to school while also preserving plenty of time for teachers and students to build much needed relationships. Many of these assessments were conducted remotely, which impacted test standardization practices. While we have found our fall data to be very useful for some decisions, we are interpreting our scores with caution. The fall assessments were administered when students were learning remotely or when they had recently transitioned to a hybrid model. After the upcoming spring MAP and FASTBridge assessments, we will be able to examine the growth of our remote and in-person students. We can come back to the board with this information and some proposals we are considering for future assessment to get the board's input. Tonight, we plan to share a bit about the assessments we administered this fall, 
display graphs to indicate our current students' performance in math and reading, as well as some targeted grade level comparisons from this year to last. We will also address recent research about student performance during interrupted learning. Then follow up with how we are meeting our students' academic needs. We recently received word that state assessments will be administered this spring. This includes the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, or IAR, the Illinois Science Assessment, or ISA, and the Assessing Comprehension and Communication in English State to State for English Language Learners, or ACCESS test. While these assessments will be administered, the U.S. Department of Education has indicated it will allow states to seek waivers from certain federal testing requirements. Illinois State Superintendent of Education, Dr. Carmen Ayala, indicated Illinois will apply for the maximum flexibility available, including seeking the available waivers for summative designations typically reported on the Illinois School Report Card and the 95% assessment participation requirement. We anticipate learning more about these waivers in the coming weeks. Joining me tonight are, just to my right, Amanda Chernick, Assessment Coordinator, and Andrea Lusso, RTI Coordinator. Before I turn this over to Amanda, however, I would like to share a quote from Heather Walsh, one of our early childhood education teachers. Heather says, I just finished informally assessing my remote blended preschool students and measuring their growth from early September until now. Every child made growth in their early math and early literacy skills, such as number naming, rote counting, letter naming, shape naming, color naming, and name writing. Additionally, they all showed growth and development in their phonological awareness skills in conjunction with the handwriting without tears letters we have presented. Fine motor and bilateral coordination skills related to cutting, writing, and developing a functional tripod graphs are becoming more and more independent too. This is big stuff in preschool. <laughs> Overall, I also observed noticeable growth in each child's ability to sustain attention and focus during my whole group Zoom sessions and one-on-one -on -one assessment sessions. Our thrice daily the Zoom attendance is close to 100% with consistent participation as well. No doubt that parental support, maturity, and time have also contributed, but I can safely say that remote preschool actually works. Teachers in District 25 have spent countless hours reinventing instruction and learning. Through collaborative planning and innovative differentiation, including remote small group instruction, we see evidence of student growth collected through formal and informal assessments. We are closely monitoring and allocating additional resources to our students that have shown the least amount of growth during the last 11 months. Overall, we are proud to report that our students continue to grow and learn thanks in large part to the continued partnership between our teachers and families. And now I'd like to turn it over to Amanda. All right, so good evening. To start, I would like to share an overview of the assessments District 25 administered this fall. I'll give more specific information about these assessments as we move throughout the presentation. So all measures administered in the fall assessed math and literacy skills. Our kindergartners were assessed using the Educational Software for Guiding Instruction, or the ESGI. Our first and second graders were assessed using measures on the FastBridge platform. And our third through eighth graders were assessed using the Northwest Evaluation Association, or the NWEA MAP test. Let me share some information about ESGI. Teachers administer these short math and literacy assessments individually to students, either in person or remotely. This assessment suite is not nationally normed, so this year we created a district norm sample for our students in order to help teachers plan for their classroom instruction at the start of the year. The FastBridge early reading and early math assessments for our first graders were administered remotely to individual students. Both of these assessments generate a composite score. These scores are typically made up of three subtests that are weighted differently depending on the season. The second grade literacy assessment, called the Reading CBM, was also administered individually, and the Math Automaticity Assessment was administered individually or to a whole classroom, either in person or remotely. 
So here's how our first graders scored on the early reading assessment compared to last year's first graders. The gray bar on the left uh, represents last year's district average composite score, and the blue bar represents this year's district average composite score. When comparing these scores from last year's first graders to this year's first graders, there was a slight decline. The average percentiles nationally from these fall screening periods fell from the 60th percentile in 2019 to the 53rd percentile in 2020. This shows us that some students who are struggling in reading before COVID are still trying to catch up to same grade peers. We will address the current research about our nation's younger learners, as well as the supports that the district has in place towards the end of this presentation. Here's how our first graders scored on the early math assessment compared to our last year's first graders. Again, the gray bar represents last year's district average composite score, and the blue bar represents this year's district average composite score. When comparing scores from last year to this year, there was a slight improvement. The average percentiles nationally for these fall screening periods went from the 65th percentile in 2019 to the 70th percentile in 2020. This fall, when comparing the words read correctly in a minute from last year's second graders to this year's second graders, scores were the same. The average percentile nationally from both screening periods fell at the 62nd percentile. On the second grade math assessment, when comparing math problems figured correctly in 10 minutes from last year's second graders compared to this year's second graders, we can see that scores were similar with average percentiles nationally ranging from the 65th to 70th percentile. So moving on to our third through eighth graders with the MAP test. The MAP test is administered on the computer and is adaptive, meaning that the test adjusts as the students progress throughout the test. Many of our remote students tested at home via Zoom, which posed some challenges, but overall District 25 was able to gain a temperature check of our students' current math and reading skills. Again, these scores should be interpreted with caution. The next set of graphs that I will share shows an average of how our current third through eighth graders performed during the winter of 2019 compared to the fall of 2020. Generally, we are not seeing much change between the two school years in reading or in math. So to gain a snapshot of our students' performance from one test administration to the next, we looked at how the same group of students in a grade level uh, performed over two screening seasons compared to same grade peers nationally. So in other words, for grade five, the gray bar represents how that group of students performed as fourth graders in December of 2019, and the blue bar represents how that same group of students went on to perform as fifth graders in October of 2020. Across grades, these scores fell within the 64th to the 71st percentile nationally. This graph shows the average percentiles nationally for the same group of students from the winter of 2019 to the fall in math. The scores from both seasons fell within the 60th to the 70th percentile nationally. This chart shows our district's average RIT score in reading by grade for the fall of 2020 compared to the national average RIT score by grade. Overall, District 25 students are performing above the national mean in reading. This chart shows our district average RIT score in math by grade for the fall of 2020 compared to the national average RIT score by grade. Overall, District 25 students are performing above the national mean in math as well. In the fall of 2019, District 25 administered MAP to our sixth graders only as they transitioned to a new MAP testing format. So we're able to look at the, uh, the differences between last year's students in the fall and this year's students in the fall. Scores remained relatively stable uh, between both sets of students. So this graph shows the district average RIT score in both reading and math for last year's sixth graders and this year's sixth graders. Scores were stable in reading and math across both groups. Compared to same grade peers nationally in the fall of 2019, District 25 sixth graders average reading scores landed at the 68th percentile, 
while in the fall of 2020, sixth graders' average reading scores landed at the 70th percentile. In the fall of both 2019 and 2020, District 25 sixth graders' average math MAP scores landed at the 71st percentile. So that last graph closed out our district data, but I wanted to share a little current educational research. Research published in Ed Week from December of 2020 found that there is an increase in children at risk in the earliest grades. Substantially fewer students scored at or above grade level expectations, with many more scoring well below, most dramatically in grades one and two when compared to the previous year's assessment results. Declines in performance from the prior year occurred across grades K through three. As a district, we did see a slight dip with our first grade reading scores, though this dip was not well below grade level expectations as has been observed nationally. NWEA also conducted a research study that looked at their national assessment data from the fall of 2020. There were a couple of research findings relative to our district. NWEA found that students in grades three through eight performed similarly in reading, but slightly lower in math to same grade students in the fall of 2019. In District 25, students in grade six performed similarly in reading and math to same grade students in the fall of 2019. NWEA also found that students typically showed growth in both math and reading across grade levels, except for math in grades five and six. Here at D25, while we do not yet have the student growth data, student percentiles were relat relatively stable across the board. So Andrea Lousseau will now share some information about the ways that District 25 is using our data. Good evening. Tonight, I would like to share the ways in which this data is used to impact instruction across all grade levels. As a district, we have continued to support all students during this school year throughout various modalities. Every elementary schedule has a portion of their day designated for strategic academic time. During this time, teachers are able to reteach core concepts to students who may need extra help or facilitate enrichment opportunities for students. At the middle school level, office hours and homeroom times are used to assist students in their classes. Since the beginning of the school year, literacy and math interventionists at all buildings have been pulling small groups either in a remote environment or in person to target our most at-risk students. Students meet three to five times a week in a small group with an interventionist using evidence-based curriculum to fill in gaps and to address specific student needs. Students are monitored for growth and plans are adjusted based on the response to the intervention. Our advanced learners have continued to take advanced math classes at both the elementary and middle school level and advanced ELA classes at the middle school level. The student learning coaches have worked with teachers to implement differentiation opportunities for our most advanced learners. In the late fall, grade level teams met to discuss the ESGI fast bridge and map data to inform teaching and to engage in discussion and planning for students who are in need of more intensive instruction. In the upcoming week, grade level teams will be meeting again to review assessment data to adapt instruction for our students. Due to the support of the board, the community, and our incredibly hardworking staff, our students are continuing to be instructed at a level that meets their needs. So as we progress throughout this school year, we're currently conducting uh, targeted assessments using the FastBridge platform for intervention planning. We're also currently administering the Cognitive Abilities Test, or the COGAT, mostly for advanced placement decisions for the next school year. So next year, we're planning for a balanced assessment model to continue to gather usable data. We are aiming for consistent assessment at all grade levels for each season. So to wrap up, we're not seeing significant learning loss across the, across the district. Although we still have some work to do, the District 25 community should be proud of the work 
they're doing to keep students learning during interrupted instruction. Any questions? Imagine that. Um, no, I don't have any questions. A lot to absorb. You know, we've been looking at it over the week. I mean, it's it's actually uh, just comments from you know, more, a little bit more positive than than I was expecting, which is good. Um, it just shows the resilience and the adaptiveness of uh, faculty, teaching, and students. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, if no one else has anything, I'll let Rich fire away. Thank you. Uh, I guess the first question is back uh, when, just so maybe everyone understands, I know it's February of 21 and normally this is done or this assessment update is done in November mm -hmm. of the school year. So we're kind of a couple months behind and I'm not, I'm not saying anything by that, just mm -hmm. we're, we're normally behind. So when we're, we're comparing things, we gotta be comparing, trying to compare the data that we have now to really we're comparing it to fall of 2019. Right, because that was the last time we had this assessment was on November in 19. We didn't have one in 20 because that's what we're having today. Okay, so I just want to bear. So in that time period, we did the kids assessment and that's required at the beginning of the year to assess incoming kindergartens within the first few weeks. And I understand the ISBE um, lengthened that time period to basically you know, 13 days from now. But where are we with that assessment and when will we see that results? Because I think that bears influence on how kindergartners are doing. Right, the, um, the kids assessment is typically administered at the beginning of the school year, but it really is an observational tool. So the state of Illinois really pushed back um, the window for, for schools because they wanted students in person to be able to make those observations which is why the window was closing so much later than in prior years. Now typically the data collected for that particular assessment would come out in June or July. I did reach out to our rep, our kids rep, and she was thinking that it's probably gonna be more like fall when we receive that information. So that is one piece of information the district uses, but I would say um, a lot more of our information is garnered from the classroom teachers, from the assessments that they're doing with their students. Um, I would say kids is more of a, it's more of a reporting tool for the state. Um, I think because we get the results back so much later after the students have already left kindergarten, it's not, as useful for um, informing instruction. So the results that you shared with us in November of 19 were from what time period? I really don't know, I can check. Because in November of 19, you shared with us kids data mm -hmm. for that year. So I'm, I'm just trying to connect the dots. And if we don't know, that's fine. I'm just, right. so I'm just wondering if we do the assessment ourselves, wouldn't we collect the data ourselves? Oh, absolutely. The teachers are collecting that data right now, and then they go in and enter it into their, um, into the kids' platform. And so the, the data that was shared in November of 2019 was the data that the state reported in the late summer yeah. of 2019 from the kids' assessment that was done at the beginning of that school year, right? From 2019? or it's from 2018. 2018-19. Okay, so the... So it's quite, so you get almost a year after it's done is when the state reports that data. Okay, so then the information on the Illinois School Report Card, which has 2020 data on kids, is reflective of 2019. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. So then, but we should anticipate that as soon as it's available or? Yeah, again, this year, as um, Amanda said, we expect the state to report that hopefully in the fall. So instead of late summer 2021, hopefully in the early fall 2021. Okay. And we'd provide it in our annual assessment report. Okay. Can you bring up slide number six? Or... So just so I understand the slide, because we're showing percentiles, we're showing 
the composite score mm -hmm. so and looking at it nationally mm -hmm. so if we're com so if I read this right we got on the gray bar we're somewhere in the 50 range just just for argument's sake and that presented us at 65 percentile nationally right mm -hmm. Correct. so then in the fall of 2020 we are now 70th percentile again doing some 57 right I guess my question is do we have something that reflects how we're doing against ourselves what I mean by that if if the entire so if you compare against the entire group and we anticipate the entire group went down right so by default even a higher percentile doesn't necessarily mean growth it just means you didn't go down as much right so um, the data is great but if we're comparing ourselves against a national norm and everyone was impacted by this have we what have we gone down even though this may be going up right well typically when assessments use national data it's typically old the norming sample like for example the map test the norms that they're currently using are actually based on 2017 so it's not it's not live data if that makes sense um, so typically assessment suites will update their norms maybe every three to five years so we don't really have a COVID comparison group yet which I'm not sure going forward what that will mean if if testing companies will be interested in revamping their norms to take COVID into account but these numbers don't figure in COVID if that makes sense can I ask, like, for clarification? Sure. So the chart that's up there um, shows last year's first graders and this year's first graders, mm -hmm. and where we are nationally. Does that all also translate that our? And I don't even know if you can compare it. That this year's first graders did better than last year's first graders, well, or no? Because the national score might have changed. The national score wouldn't have changed. It's the okay. same norm sample for both years. So I think another example is your sixth grade chart, right. mm -hmm. which does compare last year's sixth graders to this year's sixth graders, right? Sixth yep. And shows, so I guess the, the right. translation I'm trying to make right. is if the blue bar is higher, then we did better than ourselves last year. If the blue bar is lower, then we went down this year compared to last year. Correct. But the composite score that's on here is the same standard composite mm -hmm. score to the percentile. No, the composite score would be different. But, but the composite score, there's a percentile generated from that composite score. Okay. So in the example that we were just talking about yep. that we had up there with Rich, it looks like the composite score went up, as did the percentile. Mm -hmm. What was the... What was the composite score had it been equal? So had we been, I think it was 65, yeah, no, my apologies, I changed. Right. So I could tell you the composite scores, if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, so the composite score for last year uh, was 52, and then the composite score for this year was 54. And if you're interested, I, I would say scores on this particular assessment might range anywhere from zero to 115. That, that's like the range of the composite score. So that's where our students, the average of where they ended up. Got it. So the actual data though, the composite score is a delta of two. So we, we improved by two. Right. Perfect. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. If we could jump to slide 11. And I think you already addressed the question just but as folks look at this because it threw me off a little bit. So the gray bar would be those, so looking at the very first column, the third grade three. Yep. Um, and when you say winter of 2019, that was really in the October, November range of October 19 and the fall of 2020 was in December of, no, I'm sorry, 
the winter of 2019 was in December of 19. Correct. And fall was in November of 2020. Right, it was kind of so October. No, yep. Okay. Absolutely. So grade three, when I'm looking at that first column, the gray bar would have been when those third graders were actually second graders. Yep. And now we're just moving their score right. over. Okay. This is looking at the same group of kids from last year to this year. So any, you know, when we look at it, it looks like our second, our now third graders are now fourth graders and now fifth graders increased a little bit as compared solely to last year. Correct. Is that the expected growth that they were anticipating that has been categorized before that you communicated to us before? That's a great question. Unfortunately, we can't do that growth metric yet because there's kind of pockets in our data because we didn't map test in the spring. We would typically, if we did a winter administration, we could com compare winter to winter. Um, if we did a fall last year, we could do fall to fall. We don't have a fall from last year except for that sixth grade group. Um, we will be able to have that, that growth metric in the spring. We can do a comparison of fall to spring of this year to then have that metric from the map test. Okay. I, I, I want to go back just because the in 2019 map was tested in December the, the winter correct December mm -hmm. and it was done in November of this year would we so and, and again that to me is a couple weeks difference right there were different testing windows they uh, when we create when when you create your testing sessions within map there's three different seasons there's fall winter and spring and with our fall administration we came very close to that winter window because map was having a lot of technical issues and we pushed it back a little bit I the community was you know the kiddos were just coming back to school there was just a lot of stress and kind of turmoil and we didn't want to put further pressure on students at that time so we pushed the map test back a little bit but it was still technically within that fall window no, and I get that. I'm just looking from a calendar month. Could we not be able to look and compare those two by saying, okay, there are a couple of weeks difference. I, I know fall and winter, but time, you know, realistic time-wise, it's a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Can't we come back with, you know, last year you guys showed us a chart mm -hmm. like this that flowed, and so this is in 2019, so yep. you can see by year, yep. you can say by school, it says expected growth, mm -hmm. um, higher than expected growth. I'm, I'm not understanding, I understand fall, winter, got it, but realistically it's a couple weeks apart. Did, is, it that, is it that different in those few weeks when you got Thanksgiving, all that in there? So why couldn't we do this? That, that's, uh, we can have that in the spring. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it really is the map test that generates those, the growth metric. That's not something that we do on our end, that they have a, a formula, formula that they use to create those numbers and I can't go in and fudge the dates. I know it just seems like a few weeks, but that would be at the very tail end of that fall window, um, that November, I'm, I'm not quite sure, I can't remember when we closed that, that fall window, but um, that would be something that MAP would have to generate for us that we can do in the spring. So again, just trying to look forward with that. So I didn't know, that. I'm learning something new, that's good. So you're <laughs> telling me the MAP, the tool, mm -hmm generates these results correct okay but when just trying to connect the dots here so these results then are based have some number of equivalency that we put into that yes so looking at that we could probably make some mm -hmm. informed decisions on where we're trending even though map hasn't come out with the right one again i would wait until spring Okay. That's when, that's when we'll have that information. I'm very curious to see that as well. Um, but yeah, that's not something that we have right now. I, my apologies, but it's, we oh, have no, holes this is, this is, with, <laughs> we're, we're, with... This is uh, good. I, this, this, yeah. this is part of the whole process. So um, again, looking at this slide, so we just talked about three, four, and five. Looking at grades six, seven, and eight, those seem to be you know, either at par or the eighth graders have maybe dropped a little bit, maybe, don't know. Why do we think, based on looking at this, was there that specific drop? And then, you know, I look to maybe the board as a general thing. What is the community's expectation for that 
coming into the spring and going, you know, what, how do we correct that? Because I, I know in one of the further on slides you talk about here's what we're doing, but what's the community's expectation of, okay, we want that back to normal and what's normal, it, it, and I'm just throwing that out, but what is, why did that happen? Why do we think it happened? Specifically for our fifth to sixth, seventh and eighth graders, um, why didn't it happen for something else? So is there something in the middle schools? What is your thought process? And then back to the board, maybe it's an open question. What is the community's expectation for, you know, how do we, how do we make that better? That's a very difficult question for me to answer. <laughs> I will say that there are so many factors that could impact a student's uh, testing ability, right? They might have, they might be hungry, they might be tired. Um, when you start adding in other factors, like they're taking the map test at home and they're losing internet connection, or baby brothers behind trying to play with their keyboard while they're taking, a, taking the test. They're at mom or dad's work trying to take the test. Um, it's, it's just really hard for me to say what this could be attributed to. Um, so I honestly don't even feel comfortable saying what it could be because I just don't know. I, we do have students who um, showed some wonderful growth, um, some students that didn't. Um, I'll be really curious to look at our spring data to see if any kind of trends come out of that. So before opening up to the board and initiative, just give me, because you, you brought up a, a thought process. So what you're saying is we're not sure what caused this, mm -hmm. but if we're not sure what caused this, how do we fix it going forward? And I know we may not have that answer today, and that's fine. I understand that we've got to look at the data, probably talk to teachers, you know, understand that. But I think coming to that is if you're saying we have all this data now, which is good data, but we don't know what we're going to, or we don't know the cause of it, that gives me some pause to say, well, how do we assess student performance? Okay, so keep that in mind. But you did bring up another point, is that if we don't, if we have questions on the MAP scores, in order to identify our advanced learners, don't we use our MAP scores? Mm -hmm. And so if we're questioning the, the validity of these scores, how are we introducing the next wave of advanced learners? And I think one of the things we can bring to the board the next time too is this is not um, unique to COVID or the pandemic. There are, every year we have grades that make smaller growth mm -hmm. than others or have dips from time to time. So we can bring you a comparison of that in the spring um, that shows you there um, are always always grades that seem to have a smaller growth than others, depending on the switch in the test or, or what have you. Um, we do use, if you could, guys can take the next one about MAP for advanced learning. Mm -hmm. We do use that as one piece of right. the puzzle, right? Right. Yeah, we use it as one piece of the puzzle, and particularly with the MAP assessment, we use two administrations. So we will be looking also at the spring assessment. Um, and bring that into the picture. And, and really the way we look at that is the higher of the two. Um, so I, I believe we have an ability to account for the fact that our fall administration, due to the variety of factors, some of which Amanda mentioned, um, you know, gave us reason to give pause. But by the same token, we have some students that did perform very well and had great conditions. Right. So we don't want to dismiss those results. But you use a cutoff score, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm very fuzzy on it, but I believe there's a cutoff score that's used for that. So if you're saying you're questioning the validity, are you now questioning that score? And again, I'm throwing this out, so if that's a question for to take back, I appreciate it, that's great, but it, it's, it just kind of begs the question there. Yeah, I think we'd be more concerned if we were only looking at that score. Um, okay, but perfect. the fact that we have another map score and additional pieces of information, um, we feel as though we'll get a nice comprehensive picture of our students that need that acceleration. Okay. Okay. Yes, Anisha. Mr. President, thank you. Um, I wanted to thank your team for going in such detail and giving us so much information, so thank you for that. Um, so a couple of questions as far as the, cog the advanced placement. You know, when we just got through a strategic planning, 
and we've really talked about growing, increasing services for our students and advanced placement being one of them. Um, so ha having gone through a COVID year, how do you anticipate maximizing the opportunities for our students to go into advanced placement and then we have this testing, maybe, you know, how will we do that with the, maybe a little bit of a gap in this testing process or how in the identification process for our advanced students? Okay. I'll be honest with you. I think that we'll have to see. We're going to follow the same procedures as a district that we have established. Um, but you're bringing up a good point. We could very well see that things look very different this year come spring. Um, but as it stands right now, we've had a lot of discussions and we don't want to make any changes. There was a committee that agreed on the standards that we're using. Um, so we're going to stick to that and we'll kind of, <laughs> as we've done all year, we'll, we'll monitor as we go. Yeah. And it, for sure, this year is a different year, right? COVID is a different year, so even with testing and students testing at home, and like you were saying, big brother at home and the dog on the lap and everything. So I can see the variance in the testing scores. Well, would you say in general, you had said at the end, we don't see a learning loss. But do you think we don't see as much of a learning growth as well compared to other years? That's again hard for me to say. We don't have that growth metric that we would typically have at this time of year. But we um, will have it in the spring. We will have it in the spring, yes. So I think that'll give us a better picture of where our students are at. Um, but yes, it could, it could very well be that students maybe aren't making as much growth. But we just, again, we don't have that data to inform our decisions. And that, that data, when it comes, would be good because then it'll help us drive our mission and vision as far as reducing the learning gaps, mm -hmm. if there are any, or accelerating if there has been mm -hmm. not as much growth as before. So thanks for your diligence in looking into everything and kind of giving us the data so that we can continue to make sure there's academic excellence in our districts. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks. All right. Mr. President, I do have more questions. Well, we got more? Yes. Sorry. Um, just two, maybe, maybe or three. Um, I know we talked about the spring assessments. So when would we have, because we've heard a lot of comments about planning for the next year, plan, plan, mm -hmm. plan. So when would those, the spring, be available to us, really you all, I mean, not us mm -hmm. per se, but really the teachers to be able to do something with the, the staff to plan, things of that nature? Right. Oh, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, great question. Um, we have, on May 28th, um, we have a, um, our day-to-day. -day. Um, it's three times a year our staff uh, meets together to talk about students and their growth. So at that time, we will have the information that we consider. So we'll be looking at FastBridge. We'll be looking at MAP. Even though we will have administered the state assessments, as we've, as we've kind of indicated before, we do not regrettably um, get those test scores um, at that time. They'll come later. Um, but we will have enough information on that day to take a look at how our students have grown, um, make some decisions about what students might need interventions from day one. Um, we might even have that information available um, for students that are participating in the summer uh, reading and math classes. Okay. So in the May board meeting or would it be the probably uh, June I was gonna say maybe yeah. June would be more realistic we could see the plan for then how we're effectively utilizing that correct okay um, and then I know offline we've talked about this or at least had questions on this so you know we've recently passed 1-32 which is our inclusivity or inclusiveness uh, you know policy and I think even uh, Marianne Zales Zaleski brought it up in the comments is that we really need to be looking at things from a, um, a, de a, def a demographic type of standpoint. So, you know, I know the Illinois School Report Card does break down the IAR into demographics, mm -hmm. right? So people can see, you know, that type of thing. But what I think we need to be doing as a board is anytime we get an assessment is to be evaluating that assessment about regarding those demographics. Because in that policy, we talk about taking action, moving forward with that, um, so unless we have some type of data to understand those gaps, um, whether they be IEP, you know, whatever demographic we evaluate against that, 
That's the only way we can make progress by having that those measures and looking at that. Yeah, no, agree. Yeah, I think moving forward, we'll be able to include more demographic information in the rostering of our students ahead of assessments. So we will be able to disaggregate the data um, to show growth of subgroups. Okay. And thank you guys. I know I've tossed some great questions at you or tough questions at you. So I appreciate it. And I don't expect answers to everything, please. I don't think anyone of us do. So, so wonderful. And uh, we appreciate all the work that you're doing um, in this regard. I want to toss it back to the board in general. Uh, the general question I had is, so when we look at some of these measures, you know, again, going back to our governance, what, what do we feel the community is looking for to, uh, you know, to make the correction to that? Not correction is a poor choice of word, but maybe make an adjustment or what would we be looking for coming out of that to say this is the measure of expectation? Don't everyone race to <laughs> do their mics. I'll just throw my two cents in that. You're part uh, of the community. Thank so. you. Um, that I think uh, we should be looking for growth and we should be looking for is our student growth at the national norm or what we would typically expect here above that. that and that is what we've typically seen in the past and that's one of the charts that you were referencing right. from the past. Um, so being able to show um, that the growth of our students exceeds the national expectation, that's what that shows is that teaching is having an impact in our community. Um, so I think that same kind of data that you were referencing that we were able to do in the past um, would be a, a great metric for the community to be able to say, my students making more growth than would nationally be accept expected. So maybe taking that one step further then, you know, at the next time we have an assessment, we'd be able to see against the nation or against some national norms, um, against our local, maybe some local districts, um, as how we compare against those, because that's our you know, general community. And I think I'll put Chad on the spot. You know, we're now in a global economy, and should we be looking at, even if it's possible, against maybe some measures, and maybe it's not possible, some global type of measures? And I'll just say in terms of the local comparisons, right, MAP is not something that is publicized unless the school district shares it. Okay. We could definitely ask those that are using it. We have used the state assessment in that way in the past yep. each year to, to show that. Okay. Gina? Mr. President, um, I have a question. Do we have, so we've been talking a lot about Summer U and we've, the parents have, have talked about it as well. Do we have enough information to be able to put forth customized or individual recommendations to students based on the current interventions, the current information we have, the current assessments we have on more of a targeted audience to be able to help encourage the opportunity for Summer U to potentially improve this? Or is there any consideration or possibility to think about, since we won't have that data until May, to reserve some slots in case something we were to come out of that data to be able to then come back and offer because by then registration would have already been closed. Yeah, so as we have in, in the past, and Becky, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have used that data to determine what we in education call our tier two or our tier three intervention groups. We have used that to recommend enrollment in Summer U and would be able to do that again. The difference in the past was we would recommend and the parent would still have to pay. This summer, there would be no cost. So we hope that we would get more of those students being able to attend because of no cost. Um, it does not, just so I clarify, it does not mean that every student can't attend, that you do not have to qualify for summer U, but we do reach out individually to students based on that data to encourage their parents to have them attend. All right, are we going to let them off the hook? At least for now. <laughs> Until the spring. Until the spring. Spring, we're really going to give it to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To our statisticians.
All right, uh, next agenda item, we're skipping, we're giving student services the night off and we're on to business and finance uh, with an update from Stacy Malik on workman's compensation refund. Uh, just a quick piece of information. You'll recall the last two years when I brought the workers' compensation renewal to you, we've seen some larger increases in the premium based on uh, just our claims and experience. And with the renewal in uh, for the calendar year 2020, um, as part of our renewal, we were encouraged to participate in the workers' comp programs, what they call HELP program, where we established a safety committee, we had meetings uh, until the pandemic hit. Um, however, um, outside of being able to bring groups of staff and, and um, administrators and facilities um, personnel together, uh, we continued in the central office with the facilities department, the food service department, uh, my assistant, I give a lot of credit to, she handles all the workers' compensation claims, um, following all the guidelines, putting in place all of the things that the HELP program encouraged. Um, and we're uh, in early this month, they reach out to us, our uh, contact reach out to us and said that we had qualified, met all the requirements of the program, and therefore we received a 10% rebate on our premium, which uh, came in the amount of just over $35,000. All right, I don't think there's any questions or comments. Although the picture, I liked it. Next time I want a big happy Gilmore check in that picture. You know, like a three by. Yeah, so you know, I mean, that, that's like the actual check. I, I like the happy Gilmore effect. Just, you know, because I anticipate we're gonna get it next year too. <laughs> really commendable effort um, again to Stacy and and everyone um, involved to take the extra effort to be a part of that process to um, get thirty five thousand dollars back um, after we'd seen that cost go up so I just really appreciate them following through on that all right now we're on to spending money Unfortunately. So, uh, facilities management, Ryan Schultz has the next uh, agenda item for some renovations to South Middle School. Mr. President. Yes, Erin. I move that the Board of Education award bid package number one, base bid and alternates number one, two, three, and four for general trades to Monarch Construction in the amount of $566,300 for South Summer 2021 renovations and immediately assign the contract with the contractor to Nicholas and Associates Inc. as construction manager. That the Board of Education award bid package number two, base bid and alternate number five, while rejecting alternate number four for HVAC to MG Mechanical in the amount of $1,017,400 for South Summer 2021 renovations and immediately assign the contract with the contractor to Nicholas and Associates Inc. as construction manager. That the Board of Education award bid package number three, base bid and alternates number one, two, and three for electrical to Prospect Electric in the amount of $300,800 for South Summer 2021 renovations and immediately assign the contract with the contractor to Nicholas and Associates Inc. as construction manager. Thank you, Aaron. Do I have a second? Thank you, Chad. All right. Take it away, Ryan. Thank you. Good evening. This is for the South Middle School renovations, primarily focused on boiler replacements, uh, air handler replacements for the gym, locker room, and uh, ancillary gym, the small gym, and also adding air conditioning to the gym spaces that are currently not air conditioned, whereas Thomas is uh, air conditioned as of the renovations that we just recently did. Uh, in addition, we'll be replacing the bleachers that are in the existing gym due to age. They're from 1997. Uh, they are showing age, so we'll bring up the bleachers to the most current standard. We'll also enhance them by a little bit by making them a little bit larger uh, for school assembly, so they'll be able to fit more students on the bleachers for school assemblies. During basketball games and volleyball and other sports events, they'll be their normal size of what they are now. 
uh, but the school did choose to go that way to give them some more capacity off the floor uh, for school events. And then also adding new basketball hoops. Current hoops are again from 1997. We're seeing some issues with the limit stops on them and the operation on a daily basis. So it'll upgrade the controller to a new controller as well. Uh, so looking to award the three bid packages to Monarch, MG Mechanical, Prospect Electric. Uh, two out of the three, Monarch and Prospect, we've definitely worked with before and had great success. We have not worked with MG Mechanical. Um, Nicholas and Associates has worked with them in the past, has had pretty good success with them, so we'll monitor them and make sure they get the work done. So making these recommendations based on the bid results. Again, the total war amount is $1.8 million. We had budgeted $2.24 million. So again, under budget uh, on what we budgeted for the 2021 fiscal year. Uh, any anecdotal information to go along with the rejection of the alternate? Um, let me see here. Rejection of the alternate. No, I believe there was just a, a discrepancy in the way they responded to their bid on that one. Again, there should be no scope for them on alternate number four, so we just rejected it to make sure that they had nothing included in there. It's for the basketball hoop replacement, so they had a little discrepancy on it. We just want to make sure that they had no scope included for that portion of the work. Okay. All right. So AHYBA is going to be happy. Yeah, when we get things back up, yes, they will. And some of us AH or former AHYBA parents. Uh, any questions or comments? Just a quick question. Is any um, life safety things uh, being worked within this or is this, you know, because sometimes, you know, we have this big scope, but then yeah. there's smaller scope. Yeah, I don't think or there's anything particular that I can think of that was life safety. Again, the bleachers do need to be yep. brought up to the most current code. It, they are at a point where they need to be replaced. Um, so that, I would consider that a life safety, internal life safety item, but nothing I again. I think I'm talking about more that, you know, the 10 year. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I can't. Again, off the top of my head, I do not believe okay. any of these items are specifically a 10-year life safety item that were identified in 2015. Right. Um, but okay. still, these are things that we've had in our capital plan. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I just have a quick, quick comment, Mr. President. Sure, Anisha. Yeah, um, Mr. Schultz, thanks for coming in under budget. That's great. Um, and also the larger bleachers will make sense because for graduations, I know there's always people on the side and for concerts and so forth. So that'd be good. Thanks for taking that into consideration. Well, I look forward to the day when we can all actually use said additional space. <laughs> um, other than that, um, was the LED lighting throughout or was that just the gym? So LED lighting is, um, there's only a couple spaces left. The commons uh, space, the kitchen area, and then the gymnasiums will all be included in the scope. So uh, the rest of the building we've completed over the past couple of years. We did like a three year project to get most of the rest of the classroom spaces completed. Uh, so that'll be the majority of it. The only place left is the LMC, but we did already retrofit those with LED bulbs. So we, right now those, that is fine and can stay the way it is. So this is kind of the last space in the building. Yeah, okay, that's kind of what I thought. All right, that was it. Thank you. Spent a little bit more than the 35 grand we just saved, but you know. <laughs> but yes, sorry, we do need a vote. So why don't we start down there? Yes. 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 All right, vote passes 7 0. Thank you, Ryan. All right, on to personnel and planning. I believe we have a remote. Uh, we're using our lifeline here. Yes. Phoning a friend. Mr. President. Yes. Should I read the motion? Uh, should we wait for Brian friend. to read the motion? Does it matter? Hi. Hi, Ryan Kay. We have you on the phone, and uh, they're going to do the motion and then ask you to share information about the memorandum of understanding. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Aaron, it's all teed up and ready to go. <laughs> I recommend that the Board of Education approve the Memorandum of Understanding. I should have put my glasses on. I was not teed up at all. Uh, entitled Implementation of Transitional Model of Reopening, Step 4, with the Arlington Teachers Association as submitted. Thank you, Aaron. Do I have a second? Sure. Thank you, Chad. All right. Okay, Brian, we're ready for your application. All right, thank you. We met 
team time starting on June 3rd and finished on October 28th. When the board took action to change the learning model when all metrics are met to invite all students to begin in-person learning no earlier than January 19th, I submitted a request to the ACA on December 1st to begin bargaining the impact of this decision to revise the MOU to prepare for the implementation of transitional model of reopening step four. We began by using the current MOU as our guide and identified only the specific areas that required changing as we entered the transitional model of reopening step four. I will review the areas that changed from the MOU that was signed on November 12th. Section B, process, was updated to reflect the implementation date for the transitional model of reopening step four, no earlier than January 19th. Section three, health and safety, letter C, was updated to reflect the eight-foot teacher workspace in the classroom. Section three, health and safety, letter G, was updated to reflect gathering teacher input when rearranging desks and furniture in classrooms we're adding the additional student desk, or when adding the additional student desk. Section three, health and safety letter H, was added to identify dedicated spaces within each building for their duty-free lunch. Section three, health and safety letter I, was added to memorialize the accommodations granted to staff who provided evidence of the need for accommodation using district forms Additionally, this section also indicates that staff requiring to be quarantined may be provided with remote teaching opportunities during the quarantine period. Section five, communications letter B was removed. Section seven, subbing was updated to reflect our procedures for filling the unfilled positions. Section 20, Professional development was added to reflect our need to continue professional development opportunities and provide compensation for staff who need to complete this training outside of their contractual work day. Lastly, section 21, while nothing has changed in this section, I think it is important to highlight that when a change to the transitional model of reopening step four is recommended, either party the Arlington Teachers Association or the board representatives may notify the other party that this agreement needs revision and shall expire. In addition, this agreement shall expire if Illinois enters phase five or the last teacher workday of this academic school year. This MOU memorializes what is currently in place during the transitional model of reopening step four that started on January 21st. I ask that the Board of Education approve the MOU titled Implementation of Transitional Model of Reopening Step 4 with the ACA as submitted. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to share the changes negotiated between the ACA Exec Board and the District 25 Board of Representatives. Are there any questions this evening? can't read your faces from here. <laughs> Neither can we, we got masks on. Um, no, I think we talked about this quite a bit at length and I, and, uh, you know, I, and I think um, Dr. Biney and Dr. K for their ongoing updates to the board in our closed sessions. And my mic's not on so nobody can hear me except for folks in this room. Uh, but just to reiterate, thank you for, you know, keeping us abreast of of uh, this ongoing process, as you mentioned, there have been several meetings, and we had an opportunity to talk as a board in, in closed session as a, as a negotiation item. Um, so I think we're all pretty well versed on, uh, you know, the proceedings and what you know what we're able to do and, and come to an agreement with with the ATA. Uh, and I just again thank the ATA for a very positive and collaborative process. It's kind of painful to be talking through what we need to do to adjust to accommodate. Uh, something that none of us could control and, and um, that's about all I have to add is, is uh, my involvement in it and I've been on the negotiation committee so, so it's Excellent. Thank you. Yep. So no questions. We'll take it right to a vote. I'll start with Anisha. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. All right. Passes 7-0. All right. Thank you, Dr. Thank K. You. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. All right. Oh, I wanted to ask him if we could raid his snack table in his uh, room since we Sure you can. I'll just go. answer yes. Darn it. He would have got a kick out of that. All right. Um, where are we? Are we on superintendent report? Yes. Got to be. Okay. And we have action items. Is the first one an action item? I believe it is. Yes. Yes. Mr. So, President. Who said that? Yes, Aaron. I move that the Board of Education approve the board governance framework as developed on November 30th, 2020, December 9th, 2020, and February 11th, 2021 during the board's self-evaluation process and have each board member sign the document as commitment to uphold the unity of purpose, working agreements, behavioral expectations, board protocols, and code of conduct for members of school boards. Thank you, Aaron. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Chad. Again, everybody here is pretty familiar with the changes and the review, and it, we kind of all agreed it should definitely be an ongoing annual thing that, uh, as the board changes and changes membership uh, over time. Um, so we all have a copy of it. There is, just to reiterate, in the um, signature folder, all seven of us have to sign that that's the one time we all sign so other than that if no further questions or comments on the process and the outcome i'll go ahead and take it to a vote start with anisha again just for fun yes 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 vote passes seven zero all right next item under the superintendent agenda is uh oh board meeting structure update Info item, right? Okay, thank you. Um, throughout the process of uh, the board development self evaluation, um, <clears throat> we came up with several, excuse my scratchy throat, we came up with um, several questions to talk about as we move forward in how board meetings are structured. Um, I really applaud the board for your work in that uh, board workshop uh, experience. It really really was excellent open conversations and really talking about the future. Um, so these are some logistical things that I just wanted to bring up. They don't really need a formal vote. They kind of need a, a head nod or a no, Lori, we're not ready to do that. Um, but I wanted to bring them up because uh, I think they align with the overall board governance work that you did. So there's several topics I, I would like some guidance on. Um, the first one, as we look to the future of meetings is uh, live streaming meetings. As you know, during the pandemic, because we've had restrictions on attendance, we've live streamed um, board meetings during that time. We can definitely continue that practice into the future if you would like to. Um, if so, uh, we believe it would be best to hold future meetings here at Dutton. Uh, many of you remember that for a long time, the board wanted to move locations throughout the district to have meetings. Um, but if we're gonna live stream, it would be best for us to be able to buy the equipment that really we should have, as opposed to what our staff is trying to put together and, and move from location to location. So we'd like to outfit this space to do that um, if the board uh, wants to move forward with that. Um, and also I would um, wanna look into some kind of compensation for our staff that's just been volunteering their time um, coming to live stream uh, these meetings over the last year or so. So with that kind of information, I'm just looking for guidance. Does the board want to plan for live streaming into the future? Well, kind of recalling back, I think we had a few differing opinions um, on maybe whether it should be live stream versus recorded. Uh, there were some different thoughts on the notion of always having our meetings at a set place. I mean, there's pros and cons to that. I mean, you know, I personally like being able to see the district and, you know, be in the different buildings. Uh, there, like, but again, there's pros and cons to it. So just my own thought based upon where we left the conversation, I, I don't know that I'm ready to just fully, you know, thumbs up. Yeah, let's go forward and live stream. And not that I don't you know, love the, the live entertainment aspect of it. Um, but 
That's kind of my thought. I don't know. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, yeah Mr. President. Um, you know, during this past year, it has been so great to have such increased civic engagement. It's really hard for parents um, to always, uh, after a full working day of being with the children, to then come to an actual physical board meeting. So to, I would, uh, I, it would be my recommendation that we continue with the live streaming and have it at this place and have other opportunities. I see what you're saying, uh, President, as far as being in other buildings, but have other opportunities for us as a board to continue to visit other school buildings. So we're, we're definitely in touch with the school buildings, but the civic engagement piece, the transparency piece, the accessibility piece, um, I, I just see it as a plus to have live streaming for our community. Any other comments or thoughts? Yeah, I think just, hey, Mr. President, uh, I think the community just is gonna expect this. I think across the different governance boards, this is the new standard, and I think we need to, to kind of adapt to that. And if it, if it means we have to stay here and, and highlight this wonderful space, then, uh, <laughs> then we do that and we, we visit the schools uh, as we should as a board, on, as board members um, on our own time celebrating the district in other, in other fashions. But so I, I would like it to be live streamed um, slash recorded and, and available and also in this, in this venue. Mr. President? Yes, Gina. So I will also echo the same sentiment. I think that the transparency that this has been able to bring and offer to our community, and I think that the ability to still collaborate and have people come in and speak in front of the board, it, that this is actually a really great forum for us to be able to continue to provide that to our community. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Uh, maybe Probably. voicing the common process uh, through here is that I would agree I think live streaming should remain and should go forward uh, you know I think of if if our government or we have c-span that's live streaming all the time um, you know what our government officials are doing we should be able to live stream uh, and what we're doing here record it maybe have our own YouTube channel something like of that nature I think would be um, beneficial um, you know I want to get back to a point Scott made is that yes going to the other schools seeing it was nice, but if you really reflect on it, what did we see? You have the entryway, the commons area, maybe a conference room. And I think you know, what Scott brought up is a great point is that we should be seeing the schools in action. Um, and I hope someday we'll be able to come back to soon where they're action at night. You know, you got games going on, you got things happening within the schools would be great. So I think staying here, live streaming at Dutton is probably the best you know, logistical type of fashion that we could uh, arrange. Um, that being said, I want to get back to maybe, you know, as we go through some of these, um, are we then going to come back and immortalize these by changing our policy, which is 2-200, which had some of these points in there. So I'm just wondering, you know, as we go through there, you know, we get a, a feel, should we then come back and say, okay, we're immortalizing it into the policy because that, again, we take action by policy and that would be uh, maybe a good way to look at it. Yeah, definitely any policy that's impacted will bring for board approval. Okay. So we're going to move forward then with um, equipping this room um, to live stream for all future meetings. Um, and just a point of clarification, should we have a unique situation that we know we need a larger space for, um, we can always move an individual meeting if needed. Um, the next item is community input. Um, currently, as you know, we have community input at the beginning of each meeting agenda. Um, some organizations do offer a second community input towards the end of the agenda, which allows the audience to then comment on what they experienced in the meeting, as opposed to, you heard many comments at the beginning, what are you going to do about X? Now they can hear about X and they'd have an opportunity to comment afterwards as well. So I'm just asking if the board has that interest in adding a second community input to the end of each meeting agenda. Maybe, maybe a follow-up question just to kind of get clarification on that. Um, so Dr. Ben, you're saying, you know, we have it in the beginning and then to give opportunity to the community to give it at the end again. I th my, my first thought, and after I looked at this even initially, is that, uh, I do think it's a good idea because sometimes th things are presented, there's some things that are, that we as a board, uh, 
we'll have discussions about and that that the, dis that the community may not have privy to. So I think it's a good idea then when the community has seen it at an like, open meeting, then if they have questions during the meeting, then they can ask it at the end. So I see it as a good continue to keep the open communication open. Well, yes. Mr. President? Yes, Gina. So Dr. Vine, I would have a question on that. Um, I also am in support of having the second opportunity for the community to engage with us based on the information, but then I would ask for um, a consideration that those people who have presented the information then also remain through the entire board meeting so that if a question does arise, that they're the, the right people to be able to respond to the community's questions. Well, technically, we don't respond to questions well, in the community input. So. Commentary, they can hear it firsthand, sorry. Yeah, my okay. apologies. No, Poor that's wording. okay, I just wanna make sure. Poor wording on my, on my choice. Okay, no, no objection to it? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say reevaluate and let's let the community, you know, we'll see how many folks actually do it and, you know, if it's something that's popular and okay. gains momentum or usage, you know, then so be it. Thank you. And then the next item is we return to being able to host more people in board, at board meetings again. Um, I um, am wondering, and especially with the change to legal guidance, if we should return to um, accepting community input um, only in person and for those who wish to contact the board electronically that we um, encourage them to do that through that board's collective email so that moving forward um, we wouldn't be having public comment sent in electronically but people could still again email the board or they could come in person to provide public comment so that's what I'm wondering do we want to move back to that practice now that we're able to have as many people who want to attend and provide public comment, we have the ability to do that. Mr. President? Yes, Rich. So I, I would disagree with that. If I'm thinking of the wording that you're, you're saying, it, meaning I'd be supportive of continuing the in email input or the electronic input. Um, our role as board members is to seek input and seek guidance from the community and that means, I mean, just recognizing people are, you know, we live in a 24 hour community. People are, you know, they go to work at night, they got kids, they're flying, they're traveling. At some point they'll be traveling more. We need a means, a vehicle where someone can't be here physically yet has some valuable input that needs to be provided to us. So I, well, I can understand the mailing the board. Though, we're still, you know, we still are accessible via email. I understand, but the whole point of getting community input is on the topic at hand. I mean, think about what we just talked about earlier, that we want both input before and after, right? So there's an opportunity to have someone be, I mean, just think, think of it logistically. If someone could be live streaming, sees it, they could still provide community input near an end of the session, right? Because they've interacted, they've seen, they're live streaming. You know, technology affords us so many different opportunities to uh, interact with the community we need to welcome it versus you know you know maybe stream them into one area it's, if we want inclusivity we want we want that input let's take it in any in any way anyone wants to give us input and not not limited any other thoughts or yeah I, I i think we should continue to allow community input electronically just from the perspective just like live streaming anything else people may not have an opportunity to come and they may not want to put in an email, they may want to put in the community input. I, I think it's a better concept than just saying, hey, let's dump an email. I mean, people can do what they want, but the reality of it is I think they should have the right to send it in either or. And I think then to Rich's point, right, we've got to get out of this concept that we're not all connected every day with a phone or something else. And the reality is everything is on demand nowadays. Everything we do is, if, you know, if I want to watch something, I can go and watch it on demand or I can live stream it. And I think people expect that of us. So I would expect that we would continue to, to improve that. Yeah. I would say if we're gonna continue our practice of having time limitations for in-person input, we need to consider word count limitation or just something so that there's somewhat of a, you know, consideration for time and for 
both parties, just some sort of consistency, you know, just something to think about. I don't yeah, know how we do that. And it could apply that the three, so again, those electronically submitted public comments, we, somebody needs to read um, out loud and it could be the same three minutes could apply yeah. to each of those True. comments. And you still could, the board can, at any meeting can determine, the board president can say, because of our agenda, we're only gonna allot an hour today or we're only gonna allot such and such time yeah, for time. the second public comment. Sure. Yeah, Mr. President, I, I like that idea where it's almost like a Twitter where you're, you're allowed this much and if you, if you exceed these many characters, we're cutting you off. So yeah, and, and it's so only fair. Words, and, uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's. I don't want to like get somebody's idea. manifesto now. You know. yeah. Yeah. Um, Just okay. guidelines, whatever. Right. Guidelines and what, you know, maybe there's a, a number of character content, you know, whatever it is, in the message, just to yeah. kind of keep it concise. Yeah. We'll let Fano figure out how to just cut it at a certain thing, and then that's all they can type. So. Okay. What technology works but okay so any other comments um, or concerns oh, what rich said has me thinking so if we were to allow someone rem to remotely provide comments that we would be reviewing at the end of the meeting we would have to have someone assigned to be collecting those comments during a meeting well i would i would think for those electronically submitted comments it would still we'd still have to have a cutoff that they have to be in by seven o'clock because it'd be really difficult for us to monitor during the meeting what's coming in. And so I would, I would expect that those electronic ones still have to be done so that, because Lana has to go through a process to gather them. Um, so I would think there'd have to be a time cut off for those. Yeah. I don't disagree, but you know, just based on even the, the point Chad made is, be, think, let's think through that one a little bit, because maybe there is a way um, because again, with technology, and if we're going to be forward looking and moving forward, maybe there is a way to do it easily. Um, I mean, there's chat on Zoom or something, but maybe there is a way. I, I, I just think Live maybe chat. that. So what's that? Rich is going to handle. Yeah, all exactly. The I'm going to be here chatting. Chat. I don't know if you guys want that. There we so. go. <laughs> <laughs> but you may get a question from me, so you better, you know. Um, we, we can look into that. Yeah, and let's, not, let's not rush to that one because I think that, that takes some thought. I think the biggest thing is, Dr. Fine, is really. What's the cost? What is all? Yeah. I mean, it's all grand, right? We got a lot of great ideas going on here, but if you come back and tell me it's a you know the million dollars to renovate this yeah. room to do all that, I'm like, no, right? The reality is, I think understanding what is the cost, what is all that ramifications, then we can kind of understand from a budgetary perspective. Okay. Yeah, excellent point, Chad. Thank you. Uh, moving along, the next one. Um, I wondered if you wanted to add uh, agenda item uh, to every. Agenda moving forward uh, towards the end of the meeting, an item called future agenda topics, where board members could state topics that they wish the board um, to consider for future uh, discussion. Um, and um, th this way, it's a consistent way for the board members to say, can we add X, Y, Z to an agenda in the future? Um, and the board could have discussion saying, well, what are you wanting from that? Or what, you know, and we could kind of prioritize when those would be added to the agenda. So I was looking for if people were interested in adding that as an ongoing section called future agenda items. Uh, Anisha? Yeah, I, I would definitely support that because I think it um, would continue to increase the effectiveness of the district and the organization as in kind of in planning and so forth. Like for instance, we can uh, like, Instead, I know right now we're at kind of at the back and talking to our board president about what to bring on an agenda item, but this will kind of bring up openness and transparency. Uh, for instance, a, a topic that I uh, think that we need to add to. Okay, okay, we will. Okay. No, I spoke to Dr. Byrne about this earlier, and she t she said it was okay. So if it's okay with you, Mr. President. Um, the topic of full day kindergarten and exploring that topic, the possibility of it. I think that's something that if we had a future agenda item topic, that something like that we can put on the agenda so we can start looking at it concretely. Does anybody, uh, any other does comments? anybody disagree with having a future agenda? No, I don't, I don't no, think, I it's, think it's, it's a great idea. And I do, you know, support the niche of us that we need to put it back on the calendar for full day kindergarten at some point. But as an example, as an example, okay, okay, sorry, 
if it's that easy, Apple, then we'll wait till the end of this meeting when we have an open right agenda then. item. Are we going to vote but on it? Tonight one or? of the things maybe from a <laughs> process perspective, I think, and maybe, Brian, this would fall more on you, is that um, one thing that would help not only us, but maybe the community is here are the things that we're normally going to be, you know, maybe some um, online or even if it's some Excel spreadsheet that says, hey, these are the topics that we're going to be talking about. So as an example, we were talking about the assessments. And we just said, okay, they're going to be in June. All right, so now we know they're in June, and parents know that's in June. But is there things that we're going to be talking about in March, in April, in May? And I know there's, you know, we already have rough plans because we kind of do a cycle. But that way, even when those agenda items come up, we can easily say, hey, looking at our agendas for the next two months, is it something that would come up in three months? Do we need to move some things around to make it, is it, you know, is it need to be talked about next month or is it in four months or do we say in 2027 we'll we'll bring it up again you know because that's a future agenda you know so somewhere we need some balance within there scott did you have something no. oh I, I wanted to hear it though the only thing i brought up mr president would be just from a time perspective like how much time are we going to really have these conversations around it i mean I'm not afraid to sit here and talk all night, but the reality of it is I just want to make sure that we have some time limits on these discussions too, because I realize they can be a passionate and we can have you know a four hour conversation, but the reality of it is I'm not sure that's the right way to do it. So I think we just want to consider how we put time around it. Mr. President, I think that the benefit of having the future agenda items could be also though that to Chad's point, you would, the community would have a better opportunity with having a plan and knowing what's coming to be able to then provide the community feedback via whatever method of communication they would prefer um, in an effort then we can better plan to be able to assess how many things can we fit in within a reasonable time period to then also allow the community to sit here and not necessarily be here all night. And as a proof of concept though, I, I would like to support Rich and Anisha that a future agenda topic in an effort to be a proof of concept, we could go back to the full day kindergarten conversation. But only as an example. Only as it's a proof of concept. <laughs> Vet it out. Okay. okay. Okay, moving on. Yep. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to explain this um, clearly. So, on our agendas that we publish to the public, we write the word action next to a topic that it is expected there will be a motion about or action will be done. Most school districts do that as a way of providing transparency so that the, the community has a heads up, this is a topic that something's going to happen about more than discussion. However, it's not legally required that we label something as action or label it as discussion or what have you. Because legally, if an item is on an agenda, a board can act upon it. So even if we label it discussion, a board could take action if it's on the agenda. If a topic is not on the agenda, a board member can bring it up for discussion, but no action can happen. So this year we've had some meetings where we've labeled things action, but not taken action, right? Um, or, um, and so I was just thinking about, do we want to either remove the labels so there's no labels on the agenda. We just communicate that anything on an agenda could be acted upon. Or do we want to keep them as, again, it's a communication to the community that this is something that action will happen on. But if so, I think we need to be really wise moving forward that we actually are going to take action or, you know, so the community knows, yes, something 99% going to happen on this. Um, so. I was just thinking, is it, um, is it, do we want to keep those labels or knowing that the board doesn't technically have to take action even though it says that, or do you want to just remove labels knowing that action could happen on anything on an agenda? Mr. Mr. President. Yes, Chad. So my mind would be, because I know just thinking through the last six months, we've had a few things that have come up that had an action item, but we never voted on it. And I think that can be a little misconceiving from a, the perspective of the, of the community. So in my mind, if we're going to put an action on there, we should be, that is something that we should know there's going to be an actual vote on. To your point, 
because I still think it's an important part that someone understands if there's going to be a vote on it versus like there may be a vote like like to your to the earlier example if we know we may not vote on it we shouldn't be vote labeling it action it can be a conversation piece but if there's truly a vote on it I think you actually put that on it just my perspective I mean I know sometimes you know I don't think we're going to change our mind but I think we have to get better at that from a perspective of like so the community knows hey transparency this is an action item that is going to be voted on versus I think about you know just in December, we didn't vote on a couple of things and it caused mass confusion within the community. And I think it's just better to have it more transparent. So you're really talking two separate issues though, right. in my opinion, right? Yeah, so, so. In my opinion, I think it's helpful to signal to the community that we plan or at least we have the intention of this being an action item because we also sometimes are scrutinized for not differentiating and, and like some of these policy changes where we've had to explain that this is just a first reading and then it comes back. And I, so I think it, I think the intention that it was designed for, I think this year, just like everything else, COVID screwed that up too. But I think if and when we get back to normal, I think putting the intention on there is helpful to the community. And I think we should stick with it. I think we just got to keep ourselves in check that if we do have an action, even if we're not going to vote on it or we're torn or what have you, we still need to address it, you know, in the meeting as planned. That's kind of was, you know, but this was so fluid this year that I don't think we should use those couple of meetings where that happened to go drastically changing that practice is what I'm feeling. What if, what if we went the opposite way? What if we notified the community of the things that were in fact, to your point, Brian, the things that were going to be in action or they're inactionable. So first reading of a policy so that the community understands what things are, are not necessarily up for action as opposed to labeling what is up for action. And that way we would elimin eliminate, Brian, the concern that you've raised and yet still to, to Chad's point, be able to um, keep the openness and the transparency that, that other things could come up as a result of the other items on the agenda. And what Gina referenced um, for everybody is the only exception to being able to vote on anything on the agenda is a policy in first reading, right? So um, you cannot take action on a policy in first reading. It has to have a first reading and then wait for a second. So we could also do some education or clarification, right? Um, where we post agendas so people understand that. And it's something we could always revisit later to Brian's point. Was it just a unique year? You know, it hasn't really happened before, but. Uh, Mr. President. So I, I like the idea of, you know, Lori, as you just mentioned, you're providing more clarity on what are some items in some manner. The one thing I think that threw us a little bit and, and maybe just, maybe I'm hearing it from folks is that I'm not supportive of that. We're listing out the motion on the agenda. Um, you know, actual words of the motion. A uh, couple reasons. One is that I don't know if all the time, you know, when those motions are placed on the agenda, all of us have time, have had time to review and understand and provide input on that motion prior to it being placed on to an agenda. Um, and I think that's caused some items. So I think I'm more supportive of, let's make sure we understand what are the items or what are the topics that we may move on versus actually listing out a motion. And that's an option. I would say that those, and we could clarify that in the board docs as well. It's always a suggested motion, right? And it's typical procedures in a school district that a superintendent would suggest a motion to make sure that the board is aligned with all legal uh, rules and requirements. Um, but yeah, that doesn't mean the board has to make that exact motion. Um, this time you'll notice I left some things blank, yep. um, but, um, it really, and we could just clarify that, again, it's just a suggestion to make sure that all so required maybe, pieces are in place. Uh, you know, I agree with your point that there are some, you know, like the base bids or the bidding, you know, there's a pro, there's set things that we need to say in that mm -hmm. process. And I know for the tax levies, for budget things, there's set things. So maybe we do it that those that are, that we have to be very, you know, precise on our word choice, those are the ones that are suggested, as you point out, just to make sure we're meeting all the, the nuances, but those that are, you know, truly based on our, you know, collective wisdom or collective thoughts that be left to our discretion. 
And, and, I, and I don't disagree with what you're saying, Rich, except again, I think it is, as you know, it's in um, our policies too, that it's the responsibility and school code of the superintendent to make recommendations to the board and then the board to approve or edit or change those recommendations. So I would, I would feel that I still should be making recommendations, but with the full understanding that the board doesn't have to accept those or can edit those in any way. I would agree with that. I think it's nice to have a place we'd like to know what you recommend. And also we have a week, you know, we have ample time. Mm -hmm. If we have a question about what you've suggested before a board meeting, we can have a conversation. Yeah. I'd agree to what Erin is saying. Uh, I have two points to bring up. The suggested motion uh, really helps as individual board members to kind of see that suggestion. And then we do have a week to say, well, actually I have a tweak in this wording. So that, that's really helpful for us to prepare the whole week and know what we're talking about because it does take a lot of prep to go into board meetings. And the second thing I wanted to say is this, the, the point about the action. I was wondering, is it more transparent or if we were to change our mind and not take an action, could we say possible action? Oh yeah, on the. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. So um, it's got uh, totally two different points I was making. Okay. Sorry. All right, so we'll uh, move forward at this point, continuing labels, um, but also including a education clarity piece, and we can always revisit that. Um, so the next one, oh, additional community engagement. The board's been seeking additional ways to connect with the community, um, maybe outside of this more formal process that we have here, um, but the board's been talking about wanting to engage in ongoing two-way conversation um, about our community's aspirations um, for our district. So um, I'm wondering if the board, some things um, that different groups will do is to host informal events like a board coffee with the board. Um, and to do those, you have to only have two people um, or you have an open meetings act, <coughs> right, uh, requirement. If you're going to do it with more than two board members at an event, we you know we have to post it, we have to have an agenda, all the pieces for a meeting, and um, you know board members can't take any action in that time because um, we wouldn't really know what the community topics are. So we can talk about the format and how that would work. I guess I'm really just wondering: Do you want to start scheduling some informal coffee with the board opportunities? I'd like coffee with the board right now, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> no, it wasn't a yes for me. I'm just kidding. Around. So, Mr. President, yes, sir. Um, I think it's a good idea, and I think in some ways we have to at least experiment to see how do we best engage the community. Um, you know, one of the key things when we're maybe one thing for us to reflect on, we're talking about the community input during our agendas, and historically, as we've pointed out, we've not engaged in answering the questions, right? But should we, maybe not at every meeting, but say designated meetings where we will take and address questions as a way to um, you know, provide that two-way type of conversation. But I, in some ways, we have to have that interaction. You know, and that's in our board governance. We need to have that interaction. And we need to try different methods to see what may work. And not every method will work all the time. And it may be an ebb and flow type of, of interaction. Mr. President, I think it is a very good idea. I would support it wholeheartedly to increase the opportunity for two-way communication. And I would also be supportive of um, including as part of that sense of community, potentially to look at administration, staff, and teachers to be included as part of these okay. coffees and dialogues to be able to participate and offer up suggestions and opportunities and interactions with the board. And Mr. President? Yes, Anisha. Um, definitely a great idea, something that uh, well, I, I know many of us, uh, Mr. Philippak, myself, 
the last four years uh, we've been kind of talking about this idea and so I'm really glad that we're talk bringing it this up to kind of uh, make it um, part of our rules of engagement here. But um, increasing two-way communication, really important. It makes us more accessible as a group, as a board. More input, the better for us. Uh, and, to, and the consistent constructive feedback is what it takes to make our organization, District 25, a stronger organization. So I am 100% for it. Yeah, I mean, my, my thoughts, I've, I've you know, always tried to put myself into those opportunities when they were somewhat more formalized, like the strategic plan, um, not the five essentials, but I was part of the TAC committee. And, you know, I think that the TAC committee got um, undeservedly misunderstood. I'm not even going to go into that, but <laughs> the point is that was a perfect example of this district trying to work collaboratively with community members and a few board members on a topic at hand and if you would have been part of those meetings um, there was a lot that was accomplished there was very informative that we we still have some very um, positive advocates that are now in two-way dialogue with us through email um, that resulted from that engagement so I you know I guess what I'm trying to say in the long and the short of it is I, I'm a fan of bringing in these more organized sessions where we have a set topic and we have volunteerism at its best, both from the community side and from the board side and from staff, faculty. Um, you know, on the strategic planning, we had members of law and local law enforcement, local government, you know, so on and so forth. So um, I think that's, that's the sweet spot for the future of this is that type of a forum. Um, I just, the connotation of just a coffee, you know, I don't know, I, I, like, I like the more structured, organized committee approach to um, the future two-way dialogue is what I'm kind of thirsting for, I guess. All right, we can try a couple different formats and, and, um, and again, you might, we might pick one format and six months from now we have to change that. So we can make some suggestions for the board. Mr. President, sorry. Yeah. Just align with that, I think one of the things we got to recognize is that those added interactions take time and energy, which is, you know, so we got to be ready to roll up our sleeves and meet and do those types of things. And, you know, I think Scott brought it up earlier is we got to make ourselves more accessible as well and maybe, you know, visit schools more often, right? Be in there, see what the teachers are doing um, so that we have a better understanding. And that may allow them more, more opportunity to come to us. Um, or interact with us, right? These are, they're part of the community, they're part of all those types of things. So something to, you know, as we continue to move forward with this, to keep that in mind as well. Mr. President, to your point, maybe a, I hate to say it, maybe a committee, the first committee is, how do we want to have a committee to do these things? Because the reality of it is, I don't want to end up doing, like you said, a coffee where you're sitting there and it's me and two other people. And the other thing we have to think about too is if you're asking staff to come to a committee, is it volunteer? Is it part of this process, right? We have to remember that the staff members are under contract and other things. And we just can't say, hey, you need to show up for a random coffee luncheon thing or whatever, right? right? Yep. So I think we just, to your point, maybe the first goal is what does the community really want from us as opposed to let's design what we think will work. Let's ask the community what do they want and then that gives us the better option to say, okay, if they say, I don't want a coffee with Chad, I'm, I'm okay well, with that, right? <laughs> if they want to have a beer with Brian. Brian. Right, right, coffee yeah. with Brian, coffee yeah. with Rich, I whatever. Something. I, just, I just think that would be a better approach, so. Thank you. And I think that I, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Chad, because I think as far as our teachers go, um, I think the communication with the board, because we're a little, we're, own, we're behind these tables, we're not as accessible, but our teachers are always on the forefront. They have parent-teacher meetings, they have ice cream socials, they have a lot of opportunities to meet with our co uh, parents. So the, the connection, we have to have, our teachers are connecting with our community. We have to have increased connection as a board. Okay, just a few more items. Um, the next one, uh, speaking of committees, uh, is board <clears throat> committees. Currently, we have board members assigned uh, to the following committees. We have an ABC 25 representative and an alternate. We have an EdRed position. <clears throat> we have the Illinois Association of School Boards and an alternate for that. We have someone on the insurance committee. 
We have someone who uh, attends NSSEO and an alternate for that position. We have a board member uh, who meets with our PTA council and we have an alternate assigned to that. And we have board members that are assigned to negotiations committee. Um, so I'm just wondering, and maybe there's not a decision tonight, but are there other committees? <clears throat> We've just had these for a long time uh, since I've been here. So are there different ones now that we should focus on? Uh, the board has had some conversation about our policies and updating them. And so often a school board will have a policy committee, two people from the board who work with the superintendent to review those first reading policies so that they can then comment on them uh, to their colleagues at a board meeting. And typically that committee will also start going through the policy manual as a whole and making sure everything is where they think it should be. Um, as we move forward on a diversity, equity, and inclusion process, um, do we, does the board want a member who <clears throat> attends those events, those trainings, works with the administration on what our next plans are, so then that person can report out to the board. Um, and the other topic I've heard over the last few months the board talk about is community relations. Does the board want a representative that, again, works with the superintendent, our communications department, to schedule events like coffees or whatever that is, um, and to report to the board on those community relations activities that we're doing? Um, so I don't know an answer to that. I just wanted to throw it out and see if there's an obvious topic the board knows right away they want to create a committee out of or just something for you to think about as we move forward. So my initial thoughts are committee to me is a almost separate. These are all outside pre-existing organizations, association, where we are providing representation from this district. So I, I guess that's the only thing I have to have the mm -hmm. differentiation in from my mind, because the, the, and you know, I know they were just examples, but yeah. those couple of examples you mentioned are not pre-existing things that we're just, you know, looking to be a part of. So right. um, that would be my only thing. I would, I would think that if there are any, you know, like we, we talked about how the recently we talked about how the, the village used to have this cross committee thing where it was the library, the park district, the school. Like if that were to start up again and we wanted to have representation there, that I think would be an example. But a policy committee, a diversity inclusion committee, a community relation committee, I think those are kind of separate from having standing representation on other pre existing communities process and board and meetings. Yeah, and in this board's history, um, kind of the whole board has always worked on all items, right? And while the whole board would still need to approve policies, things like that, what some districts do is they assign one or two people to kind of become the specialist in that area to then provide a board perspective when it comes to the board. So we don't have to create any committees that we don't need. Um, if the board wants to keep functioning how they are, that's fine. I just wanted to throw that out there as an option. So Mr. President, in light of the conversation that we've just had lengthy about the coffees with or the potential of, and then your example of the different areas of our community, I, I think that some of these may warrant, especially um, the community relations or communication type committee could be something that could be very beneficial any other? Yeah, no, Mr. Yeah, President. Mr. Uh, uh, well, go ahead, Anisha. Thank you. Um, I definitely, th I think we should also have the mindset of uh, it's great, you know, we, right now we have a person who is an EDRED person at, or an ISB person and there's an alternate, but um, we should also kind of keep in mind that say if um, Aaron is NSSEO, but if any of us want to go, then we can be part of that. I think we already have that, but we should remind ourselves that uh, any of us as board members should be able to go to continue to build relations. But definitely uh, things like the, the ones that you mentioned are a good idea. I just think more input and more connection, the better. Something like the Diversity Adver uh, Advisory Committee, um, as we uh, has been a big topic on our strategic planning, and we're kind of putting on that lens in everything that we're doing for our district, then I would recommend not one board member, I would recommend two board members uh, because that 
that's, that's going to be a, a, a focus of us for everything that we do, um, and it's an important one. And definitely the communications, we know that we want to continue to improve that, uh, the community relations, but even communication, so all that kind of goes in hand. So I think these are helpful topics at a time, especially coming out of this year, to continue to rebu rebuild our, and make our community stronger. Brian. Rich. Oh, sorry, Rich, I forgot. I forgot. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I was just thinking about the time, you know, the time. So, funny, when, uh, when I started, I was asked if I was interested in being on the NSSEO board, and I was like, sure, that's great, I'll go. I had no idea that it was a whole other, a whole like I was, board. Board. I was a voting, I was a voting member, you know, and I'm, and on, I'm on their policy committee and you know, so it's just all of these things you're mentioning I think are great things. I just think we all need to be conscious of right. how much time we're talking about. Yeah. In addition to I think our meetings are gonna all be this long. Well our salaries are gonna double. <laughs> yeah. Well then Don't it's worth it for sure. You're covered. <laughs> yeah, get that on record. Um, uh, Rich. You know, so you know, maybe just commenting on it because I, I'm more of the opinion that I think we probably should have some more of these types of committees. Um, and even to the point of, you know, if we just look at the way we've always done these types of committees before times have changed, we move, we got to move forward. Maybe there are different needs for different committees. I do, you know, Aaron, you just mentioned you're on the policy committee with NSSE, or yet we don't have a policy committee. And I know, you know, going through the policies, the litany of policies that we're all supposed to be well versed on, it would be much better if we had Chad as a specialist <laughs> <laughs> that could, you know, provide input when we had a question because he's thoroughly examined every one of those um, areas. Uh, I, no, that was just an example. And I, I'm, Chad, I'm just pointing that out. Um, He's um, going to start a statistician committee. Yes, or, or even like the equity position. If we think back to 1-32, it talks about we, we expect to take certain types of act actions and report out yearly. So it would be good if we had someone that um, you know, can focus in on that and maybe in some ways that in some ways maybe it minimizes some of the time and maybe in fact it may reduce some of the maybe time that we spend here collectively trying to ask questions because during the week we can say, hey, you know, Anisha, hey, Scott, what happened here? Or, you know, fill me in on this a little bit more. What I could do in that area is maybe I could bring back to the board some suggested ones and kind of a, I guess, a job description or a, and, and what I see might be involved in it and then the board can see if those are useful. And Laura, I was just thinking of the other things that um, NSSU has that don't necessarily pertain to us, just, uh, just thinking. Um, they have a finance committee and they have a safety committee. Yeah, and districts, just so you know, districts that have um, a policy committee. So it, it's District 25 policy that we're going to look at a policy for first reading and then not adopt it to second. That doesn't have to be. What some school districts do is we have a policy committee and they're our first reading. And then they come to a meeting and they say, here's what we know about this. Here's why we've got it in front of you for approval. So we could morph that way eventually. But I'll put together some suggestions and you can review them at a future date. I'll put that on the future agenda. Type right. <laughs> um, and then. Um, there, there have been a few times um, since I've been here, but it's been a long time uh, since we've done, whether it's an official meeting or some kind of event that involves uh, the boards of all of our community organizations. So my question is, would you like me to reach out and see if the park district, the village, the library, um, the other school districts that serve our area, would you like me to reach out and see if they'd like to do a combined um, meeting typically what happens at those is each organi organization shares kind of the status of their organization and any topics that they think we might collaborate on yes the answer for me would be yes i think as a we are a community and public school and to stay connected and informed with everybody i know in the last four years that i've been here um 
the, the park, you know, that I've spoken to people from the park district who'd be like, and the village, um, and I never knew why we didn't do this. So I, I'm so glad that all these suggestions, Dr. Bine, I'm so glad that you're bringing them all up today and that uh, it just will make our school district continue to be stronger. Thank you. My thought on that one is, um, is, is, are there, again, are there pre-existing venues that you know we should just try to engage in more often you know i would i think it would be a little bit difficult if we were the driving force behind formulating this meeting of all these different things then it's like oh well the district's holding this meeting you know what i mean and now it's now it's talk about time commitment now we've got this cross community meeting that because we stuck our necks out there and wanted to started now it's our meeting and you know what i'm saying like that happens at, in corporate world all day long you know careful what you wish for <laughs> yeah there is a village library park district that happens at least annually so maybe we just try to re -get, jump in on there get back re-engage there that's yeah. kind of what i was thinking rich so um i i agree with you because i was going to reference i think the village and the, the the memorial library and the park district get together what i would maybe change the focus of that um, or maybe the intent of the meeting is yes status is always important but it's how do we partner together I mean we've heard a lot about planning 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 how do we partner together how do we I mean if you look at the great things the library is doing with their new um, you know little cell um, down on Beverly sorry what's the by the, by, the maker uh, space yeah I'm sorry the maker space. yeah the maker space you know it's very innovative and are there things that we can use to help differentiate and really help push all the extremes to really help our kids get to where they need to be? Um, that might be helpful. So it's, it's more than just status, because those could be tiring, and, mm -hmm. but it's really more of how do we plan and how do we leverage each other? And some of those things, like exactly what you're referencing, um, the library administration and the district administration are working together in that area, but we could share how we're doing that with the board. Okay, so see, I if Rich were married to a teacher, he would know that. I will see if he has <laughs> Okay, I think the last one, and, and thank you for taking the time on this, is to kind of think about your calendars for upcoming board meeting dates. We need to change something, and here's why. Um, we have future meetings scheduled for March 18th. We have two in April, April 8th and April 22nd, and two in May, May 6th and May 20th. But the canvas of the upcoming election, the canvas of those results, um, is, does not have to be delivered to us by the county before uh, Tuesday, April 27th. That's the last day that they could deliver it to us. And we, by law, the board must reorganize no later than May 4th. So if you look at that, we have a meeting on April 22nd and a meeting on May 6th. But somewhere in between then is when we get the election results and when the board must have its reorganization meeting. So um, I'm wondering, you can do a variety of things. You can add another meeting, a special reorganization meeting um, in between April 27th and May 4th, or you can reschedule some of the meetings to overlap. So here's my suggestions. Um, you could have a special meeting on Thursday, April 29th, with just to reorganize, or um, go th do the following schedule. Have the April 8th meeting as regular. Um, move April 22nd to April 29th, because we'd have the Canvas results. Um, or move the May 6th up to April 29th, um, and then still have the second May meeting. So. Basically, I guess what I'm asking is, do we take either that late April or early May meeting and move that to the 29th? It's a reorganization meeting plus a regular board meeting then. I think that makes more sense to just move that. So option three, for May 6th to the April 29th. Move April 22nd to April 29th to okay. include reorganization. Okay, okay. Right. Are he, yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah, are we talking the same thing? No, I was talking to the other one, but I'm fine. I, I think moving it to the 29th is, some, moving one way or the other to the 29th. Yeah. To the 29th, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, that's it from me at this point, and I figured we could just continue to bring up 
board format ideas as we move forward. Thank you for that. All right. Well, we are on to uh, second reading of a policy. Mr. Mention that. Yes. Just oh. uh, maybe you know, it's not 1040. I'm wondering if we could maybe readjust the agenda a little bit in terms of transitional update. Um, or if it's not pressing, maybe move, uh, defer action or um, agenda item C and D to another date. Or another meeting, just so we can C and, well, they're already on the agenda. I don't know. Like we could just, we could just, this will take. C, C is quick. It's a second yeah, this reading. Just too quick. Somebody give me a motion. Quick agenda items. There's yeah. no reason. Oh, see now, there's, there's where maybe you want to think about the clock. So you have much questions for second reading policy? Just plow through. So Can we take a break and go raid Brian's food closet? So no. since I, I can um, kind of predict um, what some questions might be, let me explain the second reading of policy before you read the motion, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so this policy came to the board uh, as a first reading previously. Um, since then is when we got the updated legal guidance from um, the board's attorney about public comment um, and that we could no longer categorize, et cetera. Um, so um, he suggested what you see um, on the sample policy. Um, the line of public comment will be held for a total of 30 minutes in unusual circumstances. The board may extend the total time allotted. You don't have to have that. You could do the board president always has the ability at a meeting to say tonight due to XYZ, we're gonna limit public comment to an hour or to half an hour or, um, so you could not include that comment and just recognize that the board president can make those um, changes when they, when it needs to happen. So Mr. President. Yes. So Laurie, thank you for that because I think that in terms of what we're trying to do with what we just talked about, the community involvement, we should maybe put into a policy, oh, we're only gonna limit, listen to you for 30 minutes. Rather it be more of the exception in extenuating circumstances, we may need to limit it. So that, that would be my thought on that, is not prescribe a time limit, just say, there may be times where we just, we have to limit it for whatever reason. If board members agree with that, the motion could simply be that the Board of Education approve the policy um, but delete the section in blue on number two. Okay. Mr. Chad? Chad? You can't speak. Over there? <laughs> yeah, I can't speak my voice. But I think when I read the policy, the blue section was added to basically say what you, what you were just telling us is that yeah. well, it's 30 minutes unless we have some sort of unique situation that we could extend it or we could even right. reduce like, it. We did it tonight. Like tonight, we extend it to an hour. So yeah. I think the way it's written is fine from That's my perspective. I, I just think we should, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, Rich, but I don't think we should strike it because I think we should set a limit and we have a choice to go above or beyond depending on what's on the agenda, right? That's what this is how I'm reading it. I'm just yeah, go. Uh, I'm, I'm, it doesn't say we have to make a motion or anything. It just says we may extend it. So. Um, right. So if we hit that time limit, when there's a you know stack, you can of always time. extend it in the moment too. Yeah. I mean tonight that, I kind of just that, proactively did it, knowing we got a bunch of mail-ins and and uh, you know a dozen or so. Yeah, I just think the way it's perceived and when you write it in a policy, someone you know not knowing what we just talked about or that they can would say, well, why are we limiting it to 30 minutes? So that would be if we strike it. If we don't have that 30 minutes in there, then we can we have more of the option and more. Um, opportunity. Understanding that we can move it, but it's just the optics. I just think this will never, very rarely even come up. Yep, me too. So, given that, oh, Gina? 
I was going to make a motion. Oh, nice. <laughs> Do it. Mr. President. Yes, Tina. I move that the Board of Education approve the policy as presented by the Illinois Association of School Boards. Thank you. Chad, was that the second? I can't see you. All right. So let's take it to a vote. Mr. Yes. 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 No. All right. Vote passes six to one. I'll go ahead and jump ahead. The next item is the first reading of policy. Um, there is one policy, it's actually an exhibit that goes along with the policy that you previously updated. The exhibit came from IASB later. Um, so basically this shows the checklist that a board would use uh, when negotiating a superintendent's employment contract. Again, this is a, a first reading. Um, and you're welcome to reach out if, either now or later if you have questions before we bring it back to you as a second reading. Did anybody jump ahead on the first reading with some pressing comments or questions from what we saw so far? All right. Okay. Uh, so that's a first reading info item. We could just to be continued, right? Yes. Okay. So we are on item E, transitional model of reopening. Okay. Let's say we review before we. Read yeah. Them, right. Yeah. Thank you. So, again, you've seen this many times. This was our. Uh, original plan that we put out in July. Um, we are considering ourselves in step four right now, but again, that yellow line below shows that we also have remote learning options. Here's the items that I'm gonna share with the board tonight. Um, sorry, I'm gonna use my presentation in front of me because I can't always see that far. Um, we're gonna share what the timeline has been and where it's going talk about our current step four and the situation we're in, update on vaccinations, update on the federal relief funding. Um, you may have heard the Centers for Disease Control came out with um, updated guidance uh, for schools um, in the last week or two, so we'll share that with you. Um, our, again, our timeline moving forward. A recommendation for the rest of this school year and I'll go into detail, but basically it's that we continue in our current model while Illinois is in phase four. If Illinois moves to phase five, that we reconsider that if there's not an expectation for remote learning. I'll detail summer school, but basically for those that don't wanna keep staying up so late, we are recommending our traditional summer school schedule Monday through Friday. And for the 21-22 school year, we're also recommending our typical five day full-time schedule. If we uh, are mandated have to have remote learning or we choose to have remote learning, that we would separate that from in-person learning in the new school year. But to get to some of the details, um, about a week ago, this is just an update on how many um, students are in-person versus remote. Um, you know that our next selection date for families would uh, be what they want to happen after spring break. Um, we have, however, had many individual students over the past few weeks that we have gone ahead and brought in person early or they've requested to go remote and we've made that change for them based on individual situations. So we've been doing some change of uh, mode based on family or student need. I wanna talk about what we've learned from outbreaks. Uh, this is a screenshot from the Illinois Department of Public Health website uh, that gets updated about every 30 days showing what they define as outbreaks. So you'll see for, this is just Cook County's list. Um, this is where South Middle School, uh, where we put our eighth graders on remote learning. Um, originally we had five positive cases among eighth graders that were epidemiologically linked to classrooms, to being by each other in classrooms. We had one adult who also became positive linked to those particular students. 
and a sixth and a seventh grader who became positive because they were in the same family as some of those originals. We had four probable cases also linked to those five, one of which who became positive, the other three we have not gotten any information from. So with that is when the county recommended that we put the eighth grade at South on remote learning to stop the spread of that outbreak. So now that we've been through, um, unfortunately, a couple of these, with some uh, health department updates its guidance, and here's the most updated information that we've learned during the South remote learning. Um, if we were to have to quarantine students in the future, students who were positive in the previous 90 days without continuing symptoms would not have to be quarantined. Or like in the South situation, we sent all the eighth graders home. Then we determined we had eight students who'd previously been positive in the last 90 days. So we were able to bring those eight students back. Also, students who were already quarantined could return at the end of their individual quarantines. So what that means is maybe I had to go quarantined because I was a close contact. And then four days from now, the entire eighth grade has to go quarantine. I've already started my 14 day count. I don't have to start over because my grade level. Um, and then students, uh, our students who were positive um, can return after their 10 day isolation. So the county asked us, recommended that we uh, send the eighth grade itself to remote learning for 14 days. However, as we then went back and talked to them, the students who were originally positive, they could come back after 10 days. They didn't have to stay the whole 14 days. So kind of the lesson here is that when the county does recommend us quarantine a group of people, that there are some individual situations that our nurses go through their data and would say, let's say we had a second grade class that the county said you should quarantine. We're gonna go through all those second graders and there may be some who because of individual situations like these could come back and not have to remain quarantined. Um, these are the metrics as of this morning. Um, I know some of them have updated. Um, Cook County positivity rate 4.3% as of this morning. And the weekly case rate per 100,000, and this is just our two Arlington Heights zip codes, is 96 cases out of 100,000. I'll talk with this, I'll talk about this with you when we get to the CDC section and the CDC guidelines that are now published. Just an update of our dashboard of trend over time. Um, the top one are positive cases. The orange line is students, the blue line is staff, and the bottom graph are exclusions. So students who had to be isolated because they're positive or who had to be excluded because of close contacts. What, what's interesting to see about this, and we shared this, that when we determined we were moving to step four, that we would see more exclusions, we would see more quarantines. And so you see that on the bottom graph around February 4th that we had about a, just over 150 students or staff who had to be excluded, even though on February 4th we only had you know eight or nine positive cases throughout the district. And that mirrors the last time we had to exclude that number of students in late October but that was when we had our highest number of positive students. So again, it's what we knew would happen. Um, and we continue to update this information on our website. Um, February, this was taken at 11 a.m. this morning. I know that on the top graph for February 25th, we actually had our first positive student this week. Um, and we had six people that were excluded um, because of that. We have seen, again, this has been an amazing week with our first positive case being today. So we have seen a big decline over the last week, which has been great. We'll just keep tracking this just for information purposes. Vaccinations, the updates are in red. Our school nurses, again, all taken care of if they chose. Um, and our partnership with Jewel Osco resulted in us being able to offer 650 staff members uh, vaccines. I just wanna say thank you so much to our community when we put out there that we would like to take a remote day on Friday after vaccines, all I got was comments of support 
for our teachers um, in doing that and people just reaching out saying they were so glad our educators had the chance to get vaccinated. We're updating, uh, again, we have 850 staff members in the district um, and some of those 650 were even substitutes. So we're continuing to provide information to our staff for additional opportunities. Um, just recently, we're, we were notified District 214 is going to be hosting a vaccination site for all educators of all sender districts, including 214, including some other people in that 1B category. So we have um, put out to our staff who else would like to participate when our turn becomes available through District 214. We have 81 more staff members who have signed up for that. So really appreciate District 214 worked hard um, to be able to find a partner that they could provide such a large number of vaccines to. Um, and so we look forward to having more staff vaccinated through that. And again, we continue to just give staff updated information when we find out new opportunities for vaccines. Our federal relief funding, we talked last time about the round one money that we use to help with purchasing one-to-one -one technology. We also talked about round two, um, but I just wanted the board to know we don't have all the details yet on exactly how to apply for that, or so we don't have that money yet. Um, we are confident it's coming, um, but that is still kind of in the process. So the CDC just published, I think it was the 12th of February, uh, yeah, 12th of February, um, guidance called Operational Strategy for K-12 Schools Through Phased Mitigation. And some of the highlights, um, and I know the board has the full report in your board docs, some of the highlights that the CDC shared was regardless of the level of community transmission, all schools need to use and layer mitigation strategies and that schools that are providing in-person instruction should prioritize two mitigation strategies, correct use of masks and physical, this is their wording, physical distancing at least six feet should be maximized to the greatest extent possible. The CDC also shared that at any level of community transmission, there are options for in-person instruction, either through full attendance or a hybrid attendance for all schools by strictly using those mitigation strategies. The CDC said that in-person learning for elementary schools is likely to have less risk of in-school transmission than for middle schools and high schools. And that families of students who are at increased risk for severe illness or who live with people at high risk should continue to be given the option for virtual instruction regardless of the mode of learning that a school district determines to have. They stated that in-person instruction should be prioritized over extracurricular activities, including sports and events, to minimize the risk of transmission in schools and protect in-person learning. That schools are encouraged to use cohorting or potting of students to facilitate testing and contact tracing and to minimize that transmission. And that students, teachers, and staff who are at high risk of severe illness or who live with people who are should again be provided a virtual option. So this is one of the charts that the CDC provided and the CDC recommends looking at these two metrics. They happen to be the two metrics that we have mostly been using. So on the top line of the chart, they say you should look at your total new cases per 100,000. For us, we're looking at that within Arlington Heights. And you'll remember I shared with you earlier that number currently is 96 out of 100,000. So from the CDC's chart, that would put us in the orange category of substantial transmission orange. But the second metric that they use is that percent positive, which we are looking at on a suburban Cook Region 10 basis. It is 4.3% for us. So that's in the blue category, less than 5% low transmission concern. So our two metrics fa fall into two different categories. I will tell you that that number of cases per 100,000 has been on a very consistent decline. Last week it was over 100. We were in the red when I began putting this presentation together. 
So it is, we are seeing a decline um, consistently in that number. What the CDC says is if you're in two different categories, you should use actions that correspond to the higher category. Um, so if we were going to follow that, we would be following their suggestions in the orange category. And here's their recommended mitigation strategies by the categories that they've created. If we were following the orange category, they would recommend that elementaries be in hybrid learning mode or reduced attendance and that physical distancing of six feet or more be required. So I have to say with that statement, this is a recommendation from the CDC, not a requirement. But if we followed the orange category that our middle and high schools would be in hybrid learning or reduced attendance with six feet and that sports or extracurricular activities would occur only if they could be held outdoors with that same distancing. We are currently operating in more of the blue yellow category and I would not recommend that we move backwards, but I would recommend that we pay attention to our mitigation strategies. In the blue uh, low or moderate category, the CDC says that K-12 schools that are open for full in-person instruction should have physical distancing of six feet or more to the greatest extent possible and we're following under the blue sports and extracurricular activities occur physical distancing of six feet or more to the greatest extent possible. So we do have some sports that have started at our middle schools. We are following all the mitigation strategies uh, that we can. Um, but just so you know, we're kind of operating in a blue yellow um, category right now. Um, the guidance is really helpful for the many school districts around the country that are still remote and are trying, we're trying to get some CDC guidance of how they could move to hybrid or in person. Um, this is just, we wanted to kind of put a timeline together um, to just kind of go through what we've been doing. I'll go quickly. July 30th is when we presented the model. September 1st was our first day of school where most of our students were remote learning, but all students in our instructional special education programs were attending four half days a week. On September 25th, we announced we'd move to hybrid. We did that on October 12th and 19th. On November 10th, our middle school students in our special education instructional programs transitioned from four half days to four full days. On November 12th, the board uh, adopted the metrics and the plan for moving to step four. On December 1st, we began increasing in-person learning from another board motion that the board had made about let's start transitioning some kids where we have space. On December 8th, our elementary students in special education instructional programs also went from four half days to four full days. On January 16th, we met the step four metrics that were outlined. Um, and on January 21st, we began that transition to step four, our current model. On February 18th, we uh, completed the second round of vaccinations. And then we've got some space here because we have more to do, but just for our own purposes, June 11th is the last day of school for students. June 16th to the July 14th is our summer U and our extended school year. And August 19th is the first day of our new school year. So as we move forward, we're recommending that while the state is in Illinois, is in phase four, that we continue our current model um, in District 25 for the rest of this school year, uh, where we are remote on Mondays and in person, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, with the remote option. My colleagues are gonna go over some details with you, but in basically, uh, we wanna share that we believe Mondays matter um, for that small group instruction, um, for differentiation for individuals. That's when we can often do our tier two, which is kind of in-class small group interventions and one-on-one -on -one interventions. It's when our teachers feel they can best do social emotional connections among all students, remote and in person and where they can check in with students and have one-on-one -on -one conversations. 
Mondays matter for our student services department, which Peg will talk about in a bit, and how we are causing less disruption to classrooms by doing all of our meetings on Mondays. And Mondays matter for keeping uh, the teachers with their current students um, all five days of the week. If the state were to move to phase five during this school year, phase five basically means everything returns to normal in the state because there's enough vaccinations or the spread has, has halted. And we, of course, would revisit this. If there's still a requirement for remote instruction, we'd have to talk through that. So I'm gonna turn over the next slide to um, Becky Fitzpatrick to talk a little bit about from the student learning uh, department, why Mondays matter. Thanks, Lori. So student learning and growth are really at the heart of our current model. As presented earlier, our students have shown growth, not only on standardized assessments, but also through their daily engagement, performance on classroom assessments, and conferring with their teachers. What started out as an opportunity to provide additional collaboration time on Mondays for teachers to offer dual modality instruction has now morphed into an opportunity for teachers to embed crucial pieces of effective teaching. Our teachers' ingenuity, adaptability, and desire to do what is best for students has turned Mondays into a prime opportunity to maintain some pedagogical practices that we know promote active learning and growth but are challenging to facilitate while teaching in dual modalities. These include differentiation, targeted small group instruction, inquiry-based learning, and one-on-one -on -one conferring. When students are all remote and in the same modality, teachers can more effectively provide these experiences. These are essential strategies as we keep a close eye on any students that need additional intervention to accelerate growth. Dr. John Hattie, an education professor at the University of Melbourne and leading researcher on influences related to achievement, has noted small group instruction and cooperative learning significantly impact students' achievement. This type of instruction allows teachers to evaluate students' learning strengths, locate gaps in reading or math skills, and tailor lessons focused on specific learning objectives. Also, small group instruction allows teachers to check for understanding and reinforce skills presented in whole group instruction and change lesson pacing Tuesday through Friday. On Monday, in a first grade classroom, this might mean a teacher administers a one-on-one -on -one literacy benchmark assessment to a student in a breakout room while the other students are in the main Zoom room. The teacher might then use this benchmark information to group her students for guided reading the following Monday. Small groups are challenging with dual modalities or even with all of the students in person. A teacher needs to listen carefully to a student reading fluently or answering comprehension questions. In-person small group reading groups are not gathered as they are in a typical year to ensure appropriate social distancing. Instead, teachers meet with their reading groups on Mondays in a breakout room. Whether remote or in person the rest of the week, students can equitably participate in the reading group. During a math lesson in a fifth grade class, a teacher might use an inquiry-based learning strategy such as think, pair, share when a math problem is presented. Students are placed in partner breakout rooms to share multiple ways to solve the problem. The class then returns to the main Zoom room, able to share their collective thoughts. Once again, whether remote or in person the rest of the week, students have equal opportunities to participate. Inquiry-based learning allows students to take ownership of their learning and increases the likelihood that skills will be transferred to novel situations, all essential skills for college and career readiness. One-on-one -on -one conferring, especially with the remote students on Mondays, provides more significant connections and an opportunity to assess and provide meaningful feedback to students. Next slide. Mondays matter for our remote students. All students in the same remote learning environment for one day a week promotes increased attention to, interaction with, and a sense of belonging for our remote students. We need to make sure we are caring for and providing opportunities to grow and learn for our remote students just as much as we are for our in-person students. On Mondays, remote students can collaborate more with their peers and connect with teachers. 
With some additional collaboration time on Mondays, teachers can design instruction and digitize materials for both modalities and adapt materials for remote students. They have also been able to consult with other staff members regarding student needs, hold office hours for in-person students, and reach out to remote learners. Our model follows the existing grade cy grading cycles and schedules with current teachers and classes with whom students have developed connections. Last one of my slides. Mondays enhance responsive instruction as teachers can evaluate all students and provide targeted feedback, especially to remote students. As mentioned earlier in the assessment presentation, state testing such as the IAR, IA, ISA, and ACCESS will occur this spring. There is no remote testing option for these tests, so Mondays will provide remote students with more opportunities to test in person. For students to learn and grow, they must feel safe and connected. Mondays provide time for all students to be together in one place when they might participate in social emotional learning activities, team building, or even just lunch together. The connectedness cultivated on Mondays goes a long way toward maintaining our students' social and emotional health and increasing student engagement throughout the week, particularly for our remote students. Mondays matter for our teachers to maintain the integrity of the instruction they provide and for our students to maintain academic growth and social emotional well-being, whether remote or in person. Mondays matter for student services. The current model allows schools to utilize Mondays for special services team meetings and to conduct IEP meetings. By holding meetings on Mondays, we do not need to secure substitute teachers nor pull teachers from in-person learning classes. Additionally, schedules and routines are established and in place for our students receiving special education. Maintaining established schedules and routines is critical for student progress. Our students thrive with consistency, structure, and predictability. Both instructional program and resource program staff are, ma are implementing mandated IEP minutes. We are meeting the needs of students who are receiving special education services remotely and in person. On Mondays, special education teachers, interventionists, and related service providers can work with all students on their caseloads using one mode of instruction without having to wear masks. Many Zoom sessions are held to provide individualized instruction to students while not having to simultaneously manage in-person student behaviors. In the current model, mandated IEPs are implemented as written, individualized instruction is taking place, and the needs of students who participate in person and remotely are being met. So again, what, what we're recommending for this year is that we continue the model that we're in and keep the consistency. We of course looked at various other models um, and I'll briefly describe those. We considered what if Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday was the same, and what if Monday was a partial day? What if students came for three hours in the morning went home for lunch and then had uh, asynchronous learning in the afternoon. Again, that afternoon would be asynchronous and we would definitely have some struggles with the courses that students would miss, um, especially if we did that at the middle school, but even at the elementary. If Mondays um, in the afternoon you have math, but then that's asynchronous because that's the time that our teachers would then have to collaborate you'd be missing math on that Monday and having to figure out scheduling. We would take away the much needed connection between our remote and our in-person students. So again, we find great value right now in having our remote students and our in-person students working in one mode together at least one day a week. We'd have to create dual bus routes which would impact um, our scheduling. Again, special services would need to be rescheduled and in many cases regrouped where those students would then have to see different specialists 
on many occasions. In our Monday IEP meetings, um, now um, would need some teachers subbed out of classrooms. So we're able to hold those in this unique year without pulling teachers out of their classrooms. We wouldn't be able to do that and we'd be having to have teachers attend those meetings and sub them out. We also, of course, looked at moving to a five, full five day in person uh, week this year. Again, we just felt we've already made this commitment also to our remote students and we don't want to further isolate them. It would leave no additional collaboration time for teachers to prepare for the dual modes of instruction and to partner with each other um, to make sure that their dual modes are aligned across the grade level. We would lose small group and one-on-one -on -one instruction in, in our classrooms because of the distancing that we would need to provide on site. Again, Monday IEP meetings would need teachers subbed out of their classrooms and we talked about do we separate our remote from in-person students now? We just don't feel that we're this into the year that we would wanna do that to our students where some of our remote kids would get a different teacher and some of our in-person kids would get a different teacher. So we'd rather keep those classroom communities that they have already created. And as we think about Summer U, I have some information to add to this slide. And ESY, so that people understand, that's the extended school year. That's a program for students with special needs who, do, who would have significant learning loss. So you do qualify kind of for ESY, but for our general Summer U, that would be open to all students. For our schedule for Summer U, we would return to our typical Monday through Friday schedule. At Summer U and ESY, those are half day schedules. Uh, we will offer separate remote classes from in-person in ESY, and we will do that for Summer U if we have enough staff to do that. But we first would create Summer U as an in-person um, experience, and if we have enough staff and there are some who want remote learning, we would then add those. We would continue all mitigation strategies implemented at the end of our current school year. So if we're still wearing masks uh, on the last day of June, we'll be wearing masks in summer U. So any mitigation strategies that are in place at the end of this school year would carry over um, to summer U. Now I need to add to summer U, there is information that will be going out in principal's newsletters about summer U and about that registration does open on March 1st. We need more teachers for summer U. So we have put out, um, our internal staff of course gets first opportunity to do that. We've put out information to our local parochial schools seeing if they have teachers who would like to come and be summer U teachers for us. Um, we're going to be putting stuff out to our substitute pool. Do any of our substitutes want to be a summer U teacher? And we'll be advertising on social media. So. Um, parents that are still up now watching this meeting or who will watch the tape, if you would be willing to be a summer U teacher, we need you. We do not have, I am not sure we're gonna have room for all the students who we think might be interested. So we may start with wait lists, which we do in a typical summer U year, um, but we wanna move through that wait list as quickly as we can if we get one started. So we are hiring staff from outside of the district who would like to be summer U teachers in the area of reading or math. And that would be teaching anywhere from our current kindergartners through our current seventh graders. So please do, just like our community stepped up to help with subbing during the school year, if you'd like to spend some time teaching in summer U, please reach out. Again, summer U will be open to everyone who has an interest, who's currently a kindergarten through a seventh grader. Um, there is no cost for any of the support classes like in reading and math. We do have some of those enrichment classes. There will still be a tuition charge for those. As a part of Summer U, I think the board knows we have an English language program for our students who do qualify for English language support. That has always been free for those students because it's funded by an EL grant. That program will also continue and will be funded by that separate EL grant. Recommendation for the 21-22 school year. 
we would plan that we have a typical school schedule, a five-day schedule, a full day. Um, that we would in the new year, if we are going to have remote opportunities, we would offer those separately from in-person classes as much as possible. There might be some situations like French class or advanced math class or the eighth grade advanced math class where a teacher has to have specific certification. So our teachers who are teaching the eighth grade advanced math have high school certification and need to have that in order for those students to get high school credit. So if we were going to offer remote advanced math, we'd have to make sure we have a staff member who has that credential. Again, the same thing for some foreign languages like French or Italian or whatever it is, we'd have to have someone who's capable of teaching that course. So there could be some unique situations where we couldn't separate remote from in-person, but the vast majority of our school system next year would separate those. We still need to determine how would we handle students who are sick or quarantining next year. So if we're separating and a teacher only has in-person learners, but then one of your in-person learners has to quarantine for 14 days, do they then zoom in like they do now? Or do they join the remote class? Or is there some other way? So we'd have to work out those details so that we don't say we're separating remote and in-person, and in but have to default to doing both in some situations. And again, we would continue all mitigation strategies that are suggested um, or required by the health department at that time once we know what those are. Um, oh, I think that's it. I am happy to take any questions. Alicia? Mr. President, let me see if I'm still awake to ask some questions or make some comments here. Um, it's really good to see that uh, that we're, we are seeing the light after the tunnel. After our country have gone gone through, you know, has gone through 500,000 deaths in America, that finally we're seeing those. The, uh, we've persevered. We're seeing those numbers go down. Seeing, you know, we've seen articles. Even Chad shared one with me this week about herd immunity, and that's all kind of coming together so that's really good and I'm glad that you clarified because there had been a lot of questions from our parents about uh, I'm, I'm, thank you to your team about really explaining to us about why Mondays matter uh, but also clarifying that five days begins in June with summer school correct and that continues with fall uh, with the next school year back to uh, post pandemic normalcy and get getting our kids back five days so that's good to see I did have a question about when we um, do summer school, has there been considerations about outdoor learning spaces and to kind of maximize that so that we have more students who may not, who, who may kind of prefer hybrid or remote w would come in for those outdoor spaces? Yeah, uh, Ryan Schultz is looking into equipment to support that right now. Now, I will also say our summer U will follow its typical class size, which typically maxes out at 15 students per class. So we'll have more natural distancing inside because of those class sizes, but we also are looking at tables and tents and things for outdoor space um, for the summer as well as actually the spring. Okay, that's excellent. And, and as a follow-up, um, it's you know we've heard from the community, we've heard from our teachers, the it's a good thing that come fall, we're gonna say goodbye to kind of most, most dominantly saying goodbye to the roomies and zoomies situation, because that has been hard. And so the remote academy would be a, a really a relief for our community here, so that's great. But I did wanna ask as far as uh, the CDC guidelines, the six feet, and yes, we're doing so good, everything is going down. But as far as our middle school, what, what consideration has been given towards cohorting and potting? Yeah, so cohorting uh, is hard at the middle school because we have three levels of English language arts and we have three levels of math. So if you at the middle school had a classroom like you do at the elementary and you said, this is our class and our class is gonna stay together for all subjects. They could stay together for homeroom, science, social studies. They have to either redistribute for three levels of language arts and redistribute 
for three levels of math, or they stay in their room, but they zoom in to their advanced math, or they zoom in to their supportive ELA course. Um, so cohorting is difficult at our middle school because we do have a variety of levels for math and language arts as well as foreign language, and then we have creative arts choices. The only other way to maybe mitigate the number of close contacts um, at the middle school is to do a block scheduling situation where you say, we're gonna do periods one through five today, and we're gonna do periods six through 10 a different day. However, because close contact requires us to look back 48 hours, you'd ha you couldn't do one through five one day and six through 10 the next, because you've still got all the same periods within that 48 hours. So you either have to do half the schedule Monday and Tuesday, take a break, the other half the schedule Thursday, Friday, or one week on, one week off. Um, so it, it's difficult to even block schedule unless you're gonna do it multiple days in a row. So it is more difficult at the middle school. Again, we knew that going in. Um, we, we chose to have our students follow their typical schedule and get their same leveled instruction, um, but then we do risk additional close contacts when we do that. Yeah. So no, t thanks, Dr. Biden, for continuing to think innovatively and outside the box for our middle school situation, because we are seeing um, the more outbreaks in that situation. So to continue to, to look into that, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Mr. President. Yeah. Sure. Unless someone else has something. Um, what's that? I feel that's all I have, so go ahead. <laughs> um, on slide four. Um, I thought I recall um, that if someone had that 14 day or 10 day, they can come back early if they had a test or something. You know, if they had a, a, a test. And I don't, I, I, I recall that somewhere as you were going through that it kind of just popped into my mind. Wasn't there some condition that after X amount of days they could do a COVID test and if it was negative, they can come back to school? Test on day right. eight, I could still end up positive on day 10. Okay. Um, and so really then, you know, what you're saying is we'll be revising these conditions or, you know, specifications as we know more and as we learn. Yeah, right that's away. what we've continued okay. to do is update them as the health department updates us. Okay. Um, slide number six. I think it was uh, Leah Ross during the public comment actually made a great question. So um, on the close context, do we have data or do we collect data that shows, yes, you know, we, we took 10 people out and, or 10 students out, but you know, nine of them got it or nine of them didn't or something of that nature. Yeah, we have um, a great amount of data. It's not 100% because some of it relies on families reporting to us, but um, I'd say it's 98% and we do, when we exclude someone because they're a close contact, we do have data on if they end up positive or not. Um, and same thing with probable cases. We have that data if someone's home is a probable case. We have data if they become positive, but if families have shared that information with us. That might be just something at some future date to just share with us. It might be uh, interesting there. Um, so slide eight. So it kind of ties into some of you. Now, what you've said is that um, you know, we'd spend the 675000 thereabouts um, on really doing free summer school, right? So again, not something we have to answer today, but I'd like to understand how would we measure the investment or the value of that investment so that we know that 
those dollars are being spent in the most you know highest value method and, and again I'm not saying that summer you is not it I'm just saying at the end of the day after those two week sessions you know what's the measure that we can go we can say hey for that 674,000 X happened yeah so for the um, 20 day summer you um, we can definitely design that we could either use our spring map to our fall map for those students who attended or many of those students also um, have I can't think of what the word is are in our tier two or tier or have progress monitoring that's already occurring and that progress monitoring would show their growth after summer school as well okay um, knowing that maybe switching to slide 23 23 uh, summer you Oh, there was a 20 or 22 Maybe I got the number okay um, yes thank you um, so you earlier you mentioned that we may have uh, a high demand right and knowing that south is under you know renovation is there another facility that we can utilize that's part one part two is that if we have such a high demand should we negotiate with the ATA and teachers to say, hey, we have this demand, we need more, meaning whether we call it extended school or do something where we can get more teachers to meet that need. Okay, that's part two. And then part three, so I'm a loaded question here, sorry. Um, part three would be, again, knowing that we're doing summer U immediate, relatively right after the school year, and knowing that we're trying to mitigate gaps or get people back and you know get students back should we plan on doing a summer U2 in the August time period so that we get that extra kick going in so that maybe the, the summer U phase one doesn't work well for families for whatever reason, maybe the summer you know, works better for other families or hit kids twice that need it. So summer U will be held at Thomas this year. Yeah. Um, since South will be under construction. Um, and ESY will be held separately at Windsor. Okay. Um, so we believe we do have the space that we would need at Summer U should we have a large um, enrollment. Um, the second question that you asked was about, um, remind me now. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ATA? Should we negotiate? Yeah, oh, so should we, we negotiate? Yeah. So, um, yeah, summer teaching summer school is a voluntary option. Um, under contract, we do have the what the salary is for those who teach summer school, um, but our, it does not. Our contract does not encompass summer school as part of the teacher calendar. Um, so, if the board was going to extend a school year. That would be something you would have to negotiate before you could make that determination because you would be majorly changing the, work, the teacher work dates. Um, and summer U is paid differently than a teacher's salary, right? The teacher general salary cost is much higher than what we pay for summer school. So that would be something to consider. Um, and in terms of should we have a second summer you um, in the fall some school districts do they call it jump start they don't do their summer school right after the school year they do it right before the new school year um, we don't have plans for that currently we've done some small things like that with our el students where we've had some jump start experiences for our second language learners um, so it's something we can look into um, for the future um, I can't, I wouldn't be able to commit that we'd be ready to do that this summer, but it's something we could consider. I'm just thinking that, you know, all, all good responses, I think, maybe as, a, as I'm hearing you answer that question, it may be, like you said, maybe premature. One, we don't know what the demand is, right? So that, the demand would then lead us to courses of action that we would take, um, as well as what Becky and team did a great job earlier talking about the assessments, you know, maybe one, you know, one round would be sufficient. I don't know, that's for you guys to let us know, but maybe those assessments, as you gather more data over the next month, two months, it may be, it may be indicative or maybe warranted that we do something that jumpstart or something, at least for a group. Um, maybe there are some, whether it be the IEPs that were brought up earlier or, you know, some maybe cohort that may need that additional, you know, view and that, again, just to spur them into the year.
Any other thoughts, questions? I just have a couple of questions on. Mm -hmm. So I know with the teachers being vaccinated, and I know one of the issues, I, I think I, in a conversation with you, I just want to make sure I understand. When the teachers get vaccinated, obviously, if they're exposure, right, do they have to quarantine? Do they not? Because I think, I know that's one thing we're facing in my industry is like, hey, we have people who are vaccinated. Do they actually now have to be quarantined? I just want to understand what that means because it has a ramification on. Yeah, so currently, yes. Currently, the IDPH guidelines are even if you have been vaccinated, um, that you need to quarantine because they don't know quite if you can still carry it and spread it. And then the other question on Mondays, right? I know I understand the whole value of Mondays. I think it's important, right? We, we really want the kids to have choice, the parents to have choice to be back in school, but I also don't want to leave the remote kids behind. I just want to understand from a Monday perspective, is it a district standard of what's happening with these small groups? Is it individual class? Because I know we had originally, it was a two hour and there was the whole, you know, that we were trying to minimum that we had, but I just try to understand, right? Because I think there has been some community input about just, hey, is it consistent or how, or so that the kids are getting a consistency of this? Yeah, I would say it's a mix of that, right? But we're moving towards more consistency, um, but giving teachers the ability, they know their students, they know their schedule, and when they would be asynchronous on Monday, and when they could see small groups and when they couldn't. At the middle school, it's more in alignment because at two o'clock till four o'clock or whatever is when staff have that time. Um, at the elementary, it's not in complete alignment because we need the teachers to have some judgment there, but we're moving towards making sure um, there are students that need that specialized small group are getting that. Laura, I think, uh, apologies, Mr. President. I think the, I, some of the concern might be while those children are getting that small group attention in the breakout sessions, what's happening to the others and is there enough meaningful you know consumptive time work available to them knowing that every child goes you know can do something in five minutes may take 10 minutes may take two minutes but is there sufficient you know items there that uh, to keep the uh, children engaged so we can definitely remind staff of that okay. interest okay um another question i'm sorry on slide 23, just to clarify, um, yep. So when you say offer remote classes, just to be clear, one of the options probably on the table could be not only where a remote academy is cross school um, due to numbers. For example, you know, Olive is very high in, in person. There may be other, you know, different numbers or different things to ma maximize that. Yeah, so those remote courses, if we have them next year, would, could be a second grade class that has students from a variety of schools in the district so that we do create class sizes more similar to our in-person numbers. As opposed to if you have a Dryden second grade remote class and there's only two kids who wish to do it. Mr. President, I have one more question. Looking at the, I know that we have the recommendation for next year, and I'm just trying to understand, right? Because I heard a lot of the parents tonight talking about they have to plan, right? Everybody has to plan for next year. When is the expectation? I mean, I know this is our plan, but when is the expectation that this will be formally like presented to say, okay, we know, I understand this is a fluid situation, but the reality of it is COVID is not going away. We know that we may not be in phase five until later, but is the goal to say, hey, we will have it by, you know, May 15th, this is the time frame so that parents know but this is what they're signing up for. Obviously, we know that they may change their mind, things happen, but the reality is I just, I think what, one of the things the community really wants to understand is the timing for the planning so that how do we make sure that's out there? I know this is great that we're gonna be back and everything, but I really think parents need to understand like, and teachers, right? Hey, this is what I'm expecting to do for next year as opposed to, Instead of sitting here, we talk about it, but when will we have it? I guess that's what I want to really understand. We can make sure that we have our kind of formal brochure document um, ready to go um, at a late March or early April meeting. I see the light's still on. So, no, I, I turned it off and then I turned it back yeah. on. So, Rich. Uh, no, so Mr. President, I guess, you know, part of the are we prepared to make a motion then? Oh, 
Because I'll make a motion at this point. Well, I just had a clarification sure. question. Sure, That's Anisha. Okay, Mr. President. So uh, you brought up a really good point, Chad. So, uh, Dr. Bain, like you said late March, April, and but we also heard parents saying that folks are signing up for preschools and programs and so forth. So, uh, but they should take it from this meeting and the communication that comes out of this meeting that next year, starting next year, school is five days, be, you know, they should feel confident. Yeah, exactly. That. We'll send a follow-up letter tomorrow that shares with the community, here's what occurred at the board meeting and that the plan is for a typical school year for 21-22, that we're determining still if there would be a remote option, but if so, it would be a remote academy type style separate from in-person. Okay, no, thank you for the clear communication. Hey, Mr. President, I do have one more question before we move sure, forward. Jeff. Sorry, I know early on I wrote down in the comments, you said that you already had, I know we have a date, but people can select to come back, right? So we said after spring break, a time frame that we're gonna give the parents who are remote currently the option to come back and wishful thinking or hopeful thinking. Let's say that we get more parents coming back and we end up with less than a small percentage of kids now in remote. Is there, I know you showed those two options, but is there another, situation that could occur right the reality is with the vaccine rolling out everything we could see the numbers drop still further and you could end up with 96 percent back what are we doing in those situations because to me then there, there we may have to be another situation to say hey it is time for five days right i, I don't want to push that but i just want to understand like what is your plan because if we get to that point we may have to have a whole nother situation where we do a remote academy sooner than later yeah. just yeah, absolutely, Chad, good question. Again, and that comes under we need to remain fluid, right? So with what we know now, this is what we plan to do moving forward. But if we do start to see, wow, we have more classes that don't have remote than that do have remote now, we can talk about, what oh, should we, can we revisit it again? All right, Rich has got a motion. Uh, Mr. President. Yes, Rich. I move that the superintendent develop plans supportive of recommendations as outlined on slides 22 and 23 of the February 25th transitional model of reopening that the superintendent provide periodic planning updates to the board as needed. Can you read it again? So just for my understanding, you're referencing the summer use slide and the next year slide. Correct. Okay. For, for our policies, for us to say yes, we're we're all supportive. We need to say yes, we're all supportive. Or no, we're not. Supportive. I guess I want to make a Sorry, are yeah. you asking for an update? Because I know what I was asking for is like I would like to see some sort of not just an update, but an actual plan by a okay. time frame. Well, because I think it's great to say an update, but in my perspective, okay. I know you said March, April. But the reality of it is, if we could have something in, you know, tangent. But we know it could be fluid, but the reality is at least this is a, hey, here's what's going to happen so that we can, I would prefer to have it so that we have a set date because okay. just learning from planning anything, you got to have a date. If you don't plan that date, we're never going to, and then I think the community then allows them to say, okay, as of, you know, whatever date we're going to put this out, they get an idea and then they can start thinking through what they're going to do. But I, I agree with, I don't know if we need a motion, but it, I would prefer yeah, to that's say that what we have I'm a date. With. I don't know that we need a motion. I almost... So I would almost I, ask that, no offense, that we, but that we it feels like that we uh, we're pushing that, for a motion right. that wasn't there. I don't know if the motion or, the, and I guess that's my question, right? More from a formality. I want to set time frame and a yeah. date that we can get something back. If we have to put in a motion because then that puts it into a directive yeah. for Dr. Bynes, I don't know, but I just want to make sure like from my perspective, I would just want to set date that we can, you know, guarantee, guarantee the community they're going to get something back. Okay. So, Brian, back to your question though, the, the topic at hand was an action item today. So again, for us to provide meaningful direction to the superintendent that says we agree with this, we need to put a motion in place to say we agree with this. I disagree. <laughs> I, I think you're stretching. I think, I'm not sure okay. what, Lori, what your recommendation had been, would have been for us tonight, but I feel like we are asking you now to provide at the next meeting the final plan for next year. I don't think we need a motion for that. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Well, at some point you need to approve the educational services, 
right? At some point, you need to provide direction as to this is what the community wants, right? And so, again, coming out of this meeting, I know you're saying, well, update, well, this was the recommendation, but the recommendation wasn't acted on, right? So, we're not making changes to the current plan from what I'm presenting and suggesting, so there doesn't need to be a motion on that. Moving forward, we'd be, be I'm stating that we would do summer school like we typically would and the next school year like we okay. typically would, right? If we're gonna alter that, then the board would need to take action on altering it for a new plan moving forward. If the plan moving forward is typical school year, nothing needs to happen. If it's typical school year with a remote academy or with other things, then yes, the board would need to approve that. But we don't know that yet. We don't know that right. yet. Right, so I'm, that's where I was kind of struggling but, with But that. what Chad said is correct. So you all just asked me to bring you this yeah. information. That can absolutely be done without a motion. Okay. So, ideally, right, we would, in this plan, I guess in my perspective, to your point, Rich, we want to understand, right, we may not know all the costs, but ideally, okay, what yep. if we do a summer, if we do this remote, what is what is the cost? I think those are the things from, from our perspective to understand what we're approving, because obviously it's also then getting ready for the summer to say, okay, not only are you gonna do a remote academy potentially in the summer, you have to make sure we have the right staff for that. And then in the come fall, we have to make sure we have the funding for all that and what is it gonna cost us? So I think that's why for me, I would like to know that by you know next month or whatever, one of the meetings in, mm -hmm. in eight, you know, that time frame, so that we can really understand the budgetary, all those other things. Is there any additional okay. technology we need? Because right, if we're gonna have a, a remote academy, what is else is involved in that that we don't even, we're not even thinking about right now. So I just wanna make sure we have all of that in a document that we can say, okay, this is what we understand you're doing and this is the why and then this is what, the how much it's gonna cost us. Chad wants a 2020 to MOU. So, Miss, Mr. President yes, and Gina. Dr. Bine, um, I want to make sure that, that I'm crystal clear on this because I, I find myself a little confused all of a sudden. Um, as we walk out, to Anisha's point earlier, as we walk out of this meeting tonight, the community is to understand that there, that we will be going back to normal five days a week in-person learning effective summer U on June 15th of 2021. So what Chad's asking for as incremental detail is simply the analytics and the plan on if we were to in the fall and for summer U offer a remote academy option. I just want to make sure that, I, that I'm clear though, mm -hmm. there's, there's no questionability or no planning necessary around five days in person as normal as it can be education. The entire question of the plan revolves around the ability to continue to offer choice to our community around a remote option of education. Yeah. And, and I would add that it could be very possible that we open with a plan for a typical year next year, but we still need masks. We still need yep. some mitigation yeah. strategies, so right? No. Like <laughs> IDPH just changed that they don't recommend temperature checks anymore. So even if we didn't have a remote section, I would still at this point want to say to the board, but here are still unique things that have to happen, even if we have a typical school year, mm -hmm. if we're still needing masks or other mitigation strategies. Right. Right. I but I could definitely provide that. What we heard from the community is they just want an understanding of what it's going to look like and you know, what we need to know what we're going to be voting on because I think we then have to start pushing forward those costs and everything from a budget area. And our teachers need to know, right, are we changing right, their right. working conditions right. or mm -hmm. is it back to complete normal next Correct. year? And, and, and so to, to your point that I think you've always said, sorry, I'm going the mic on, you've always said going back to five days is, and outside of maybe the you know distancing and everything it's been pretty it's pretty straightforward it's back to what we would call normal teaching perspective right um, there may be some issues with small groups because if we're still having to not 
be in close contact, but the reality is the teachers will have the same model, and then they won't have to deal with a Zoomie and a Roomie. It's just right. this way. Okay. Well, then, Anisha? And a, uh, just one more thing to add to what Chad was saying is that um, hopefully this pandemic never comes back, right, from ever. Uh, but in planning to make sure that we have plan A, plan B, plan C, that if there was supposed to be, uh, if, if a resurgence happens, if COVID comes back for any reason, that we're ready with concrete plans, meticulous planning, and that there's still, you know, no, um, the, the whole, the duality of roomies and zoomies that doesn't happen again, and that we have a remote academy and that we plan for all scenarios as, po as much as possible. Thank you. So, Mr. President, then coming back to Anisha's point, based on what Chad was saying, it's more than just the addition of remote. It would truly be the plan, because you have to take in the teaching conditions that are going to be there. Are we returning to those teaching conditions? What, you know, all those types of things that are going to be there. You know, Anisha brings up a great point about if something happens, but I'd almost, what I'd ask you to maybe clarify or maybe add to is that I would not expect all that to be done by the next session right. I think you know at worst maybe come back and say or at best come back and say hey you know next next session I'll be able to provide the plan for the core and then you know plan B C and D we can develop in April May and June but plan A is this is the one we're going with this is the impact to the to the community this is when they need to know they're going to be making selections for this they're making selections for that all that this is what the cost will be. This will be the metrics, you know, those types of steps so that we have, uh, and we in the community knows what to expect. All right, so. Um, then I'll refrain my motion because then it's really premature. Yeah, that's. So that's fine. Okay. Thank You're you for comfortable that. Comfortable with that? All right. Aaron, so thank you. don't need a motion. Well, Just actually, me up next time. here's a motion you can do. We need a motion to move back in the car. Oh, yeah. How's that? Mr. President, yes. I move that the Board of Education for Arlington Heights School District 25 move back to closed session. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Gina. Uh,